Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Nemesis of Fire, case number three for Dr. John's Silence, part one. By some means which I never could fathom, John Silence always contrived to keep the compartment to himself, and as the train had a clear run of two hours before the first stop, there was ample time to go over the preliminary facts of the case. He had telephoned to me that very morning, and even through the disguise of the miles of wire, the thrill of incalculable adventure had sounded in his voice. As if it were an ordinary country visit, he called, in reply to my question, and don't forget to bring your gun. With blank cartridges, I suppose, for I knew his rigid principles with regard to the taking of life, and guessed that the guns were merely for some obvious purpose of disguise. Then he thanked me for coming, mentioned the train, snapped down the receiver, and left me vibrating with the excitement of anticipation to do my packing, for the honor of accompanying Dr. John's silence on one of his big cases was what many would have considered an empty honor and risky. Certainly the adventure held all manner of possibilities, and I arrived at Waterloo with the feelings of a man who is about to embark on some dangerous and peculiar mission in which the dangers he expects to run will not be the ordinary dangers to life and limb, but of some secret character difficult to name and still more difficult to cope with. The manor house has a high sound, he told me, as we sat with our feet up and talked but I believe it is little more than an overgrown farmhouse in the desolate heather countryside beyond that town. And its owner, Colonel Wagg, a retired soldier with a taste for books, lives there practically alone, I understand, with an elderly invalid sister. So you need not look forward to a lively visit, unless the case provides some excitement of its own. Which is likely? By way of reply, he handed me a letter marked private. It was dated a week ago and signed yours faithfully, Horace Rag. He heard of me, you see, through Captain Anderson, the doctor explained modestly, as though his fame were not almost worldwide. You remember that Indian obsession case? I read the letter. Why it should have been marked private was difficult to understand. It was very brief, direct, and to the point. It referred by way of introduction to Captain Anderson and then stated quite simply that the writer needed help of a peculiar kind and asked for a personal interview, a morning interview, since it was impossible for him to be absent from the house at night. The letter was dignified even to the point of abruptness, and it is difficult to explain how it managed to convey to me the impression of a strong man, shaken and perplexed. Perhaps the restraint of the wording and the mystery of the affair had something to do with it, and the reference to the Anderson case the horror of which lay still vivid in my memory, may have touched the sense of something rather ominous and alarming. But whatever the cause, there was no doubt that an impression of serious peril rose somehow out of that white paper with a few lines of firm writing. And the spirit of a deep uneasiness ran between the words and reached the mind without any visible form of expression. And when you saw this, I asked, returning the letter as the train rushed clattering noisily through Clapham Junction. I have not seen him, was the reply. The man's mind was charged to the brim when he wrote that, full of vivid mental pictures. Notice the restraint of it. For the main character of his case, psychometry could be depended upon. The scrap of paper his hand has touched is sufficient to give me another mind, a sensitive and sympathetic mind, clear mental pictures of what is going on, I think I have a very sound general idea of his problem. So, there may be excitement after all? John Silence waited a moment before he replied. Something very serious is amiss there, he said gravely at length. Someone, not himself, I gather, has been meddling with a rather dangerous kind of gunpowder. So yes, there may be excitement, as you put it. And my duties, I asked, with a decidedly growing interest. Remember, I am your assistant. 
behaved like an intelligent, confidential secretary. Observe everything without seeming to. Say nothing. Nothing that means anything. Be present at all interviews. I may ask a good deal of you. For if my impressions are correct, this is... He broke off suddenly. But I won't tell you my impression yet, he resumed after a moment's thought. Just watch and listen as the case proceeds. Form your own impressions and cultivate your intuitions. We come as ordinary visitors, of course, he added, a twinkle showing for an instant in his eyes, hence the guns. Though disappointed not to hear more, I recognized the wisdom of his words and knew how valueless my impressions would be once the powerful suggestion of having heard his own lay behind them. I likewise reflected that intuition joined to a sense of humor was of more use to a man than double the quantity of mere brains as such. Before putting the letter away, however, he handed it back, telling me to place it against my forehead for a few moments and then describe any pictures that came spontaneously into my mind. Don't deliberately look for anything. Just imagine you see the inside of the eyelid and wait for pictures that rise against its dark screen. I followed his instructions, making my mind as nearly as blank as possible, but no vision came. I saw nothing but the lines of light that passed to and fro like the changes of a kaleidoscope across the blackness. A momentary sensation of warmth came and went curiously. You see what, he asked presently. Nothing, I was obliged to admit disappointedly. Nothing but the usual flashes of light one always sees, only perhaps they are more vivid than usual. He said nothing by way of comment or reply, and they grouped themselves now and then. I continued with painful candor, for I longed to see the pictures he had spoken of, grouped themselves into globs and round balls of fire, and the lines that flash about sometimes look like triangles and crosses, almost like geometrical figures. Nothing more. I opened my eyes again and gave him back the letter. It makes my head hot, I said, feeling somehow unworthy for not seeing anything of interest but the look in his eyes arrested my attention at once. That sensation of heat is important, he said significantly. It was certainly real and rather uncomfortable, I replied, hoping he would expand and, expl and explain. There was a distinct feeling of warmth, internal warmth, somewhere oppressive in a sense. That is interesting, he remarked, putting the letter back in his pocket and selling himself in the corner with newspapers and books. He vouchsafed nothing more, and I knew the uselessness of trying to make him talk. Following the example, I settled likewise with magazines into my corner. But when I closed my eyes again to look for the flashing lights and the sensation of heat, I found nothing but the usual phantasmagoria of the day's events, faces, scenes, memories, and in due course, I fell asleep and then saw nothing at all of any kind. When we left the train after six hours traveling at a little wayside station, Standing without trees in a world of sand and heather, the late October shadows had already dropped their somber veil upon the landscape, and the sun dipped almost out of sight behind the moorland hills. In a high dog cart, behind a fast horse, we were soon rattling across the undulating stretches of an open and bleak country, the keen air stinging our cheeks, and the sense of pine and bracken strong about us. Bare hills were faintly visible against the horizon, and the coachman, pointed to a bank of distant shadows on our left, where he told us the sea lay. Occasional stone farmhouses standing back from the road among straggling fir trees and large black barns that seemed to shift past us with movement of their own in the gloom were the only signs of humanity and civilization that we saw, until at the end of a bracing five miles the lights of the lodge gates flared before us and we plunged into a thick grove of pine trees that concealed the manor house up to the moment of actual arrival. Colonel Ragg himself met us in the hall. He was a typical army officer who had seen service, real service, found himself in the process. He was tall and well-built, broad on the shoulders, but lean as a greyhound, with grave eyes, rather stern and a mustache turning gray. I judged him to be about 60 years of age, but his movements showed a suppleness of strength and agility that contradicted the years. The face was full of character and resolution, the face of a man to be depended upon, and the straight gray eyes, it seemed to me, wore a veil of perplexed anxiety that he made no attempt to disguise. The whole appearance of the man at once clothed the adventure with gravity and importance. 
a matter that gave such a man cause for serious alarm, I felt must be something real and of genuine moment. His speech and manner, as he welcomed us, were like his letter, simple and sincere. He had a nature as direct and undeviating as a bullet. Thus, he showed plainly a surprise that Dr. Sines had not come alone. My confidential secretary, Mr. Hubbard, the doctor, is said, introducing me, and the steady gaze and powerful shake of the hand I then received were well calculated. I remember thinking to drive home the impression that he was a man who was not to be trifled with, and whose perplexity must spring from some very real and tangible cause. And quite obviously, he was relieved that we had come. His welcome was unmistakably genuine. He led us at once into a room, half library, half smoking room, that opened out of a low-ceilinged hall. The manor house gave the impression of a rambling and glorified farmhouse, solid, ancient, comfortable, and woolly unpretentious. And so it was. Only the heat of the place struck me as unnatural. This room with a blazing fire may have seemed uncomfortably warm after the long drive through the night air. Yet it seemed to me that the hall itself and the whole atmosphere of the house breathed a warmth that hardly belonged to well-filled grates or the pipes of hot air and water. It was not the heat of the greenhouse. It was an oppressive heat that somehow got into the head and mind. It stirred a curious sense of uneasiness in me, and I caught myself thinking of the sensation of warmth that emanated from the letter in the train. I heard him thanking Dr. Silence for having come. There was no preamble, and the exchange of civilities was of the briefest description. Evidently, there was a man who, like my companion, loved action rather than talk. His manner was straightforward and direct. I saw him in a flash, puzzled, worried, harassed, into a state of alarm by something he could not comprehend, forced to deal with things he would have preferred to despise, yet facing it all with dogged seriousness and making no attempt to conceal that he felt secretly ashamed of his incompetence. So, I cannot offer you much entertainment beyond that of my own company and the queer business that has been going on here and is still going on, he said, with a slight inclination of the head towards me by way of including me in his confidence. I think, Colonel Ragg, replied John Silence impressively, that we shall none of us find the time hang heavy. I gather we shall have our hands full. The two men looked at one another for the space of some seconds, and there was an indefinable quality in their silence which for the first time made me admit a swift question into my mind, and I wondered a little at my rashness in coming with so little reflection into a big case of this incalculable doctor. But no answer suggested itself, and to withdraw was, of course, inconceivable. The gates had closed behind me now, and the spirit of the adventure was already besieging my mind with its advance guard of a thousand little hopes and fears. Explaining that he would wait till after dinner to discuss anything serious, as no reference was ever made before his sister. He led the way upstairs and showed us personally to our rooms, and it was just as I was finishing dressing that a knock came at my door and Dr. Silence entered. He was always what is called a serious man, so that even in moments of comedy he felt he never lost sight of the profound gravity of life. But as he came across the room to me, I caught the expression of his face and understood in a flash that he was now in his most grave and earnest mood. He looked almost troubled, I stopped fumbling with my black tie and stared. It is serious, he said, speaking in a low voice. More so even than I imagined. Colonel Ragg's control over his thoughts concealed a great deal, and my psychometrizing of the letter. I looked in to warn you to keep yourself well in hand, generally speaking. Haunted house, I asked, conscious of a distinct shiver down my back. But he smiled gravely at the question. Haunted house of life, more likely, he replied, and a look came into his eyes, which I had only seen there when a man's soul was in the toils and he was thick in the fight of rescue. He was stirred in the deeps. Colonel Ragg, or the sister, I asked hurriedly, for the gong was sounding. Neither directly, he said from the door. Something far older, something very, very remote indeed. This thing has to do with the ages unless I am mistaken greatly, the ages on which the mist of memory have long lain undisturbed. He came across the floor very quickly with a finger on his lips, looking at me with a peculiar searchingness of gaze. Are you aware yet of anything odd here? He asked in a whisper, anything you cannot quite define? 
For instance, tell me, Hubbard, for I want to know all your impressions. They may help me. I shook my head, avoiding his gaze, for there was something in the eyes that scared me a little, but he was so in earnest that I set my mind keenly searching. Nothing yet, I replied truthfully, wishing I could confess to a real emotion, nothing but the strange heat of the place. He gave a little jump forward in my direction. The heat again, that's it, he exclaimed, as though glad of my corroboration. And how would you describe it, perhaps, he asked quickly, with a hand on the doorknob. It doesn't seem like ordinary physical heat, I said, casting about in my thoughts for a definition. More a mental heat, he interrupted, a glowing of thought and desire, a sort of feverish warmth of the spirit. Isn't that it? I admitted that he had exactly described my sensations. Good, he said, as he opened a door and with an indescribable gesture that combined a warning to be ready with a sign of praise from my correct intuition, he was gone. I hurried after him and found the two men waiting for me in front of the fire. I ought to warn you, our host was saying as I came in, that my sister whom you will meet at dinner is not aware of the real object of your visit. She is under the impression that we are interested in the same line of study, folklore, and that your researches have led to my seeking acquaintance. She comes to dinner in her chair, you know. It will be a great pleasure to her to meet you both. We have few visitors. So that on entering the hot dining room, we were prepared to find Miss Rag already at her place, seated in a sort of bath chair. She was a vivacious and charming old lady with smiling expression and bright eyes, and she chatted all through dinner with unfailing spontaneity. She had that face, unlined and fresh, that some people carry through life from the cradle to the grave. Her smooth, plump cheeks were all pink and white, and her hair, still dark, was divided into two glossy and sleek halves on either side of a careful parting. She wore gold-rimmed glasses, and at her throat was a large scarab of green jasper that made a very handsome brooch. Her brother and Dr. Silence talked little, so that most of the conversation was carried on between herself and me, and she told me a great deal about the history of the old house, most of which I fear I listened to with but half an ear. And when Cromwell stayed here, she babbled on, he occupied the very room upstairs that used to be mine, but my brother thinks it's safer for me to sleep on the ground floor, now in case of fire. And this sentence has stayed in my memory only because of the sudden way her brother interrupted her and instantly led the conversation on to another topic. The passing reference to fire seemed to have disturbed him, and thenceforward he directed the talk himself. It was difficult to believe that this lively and animated old lady sitting beside me and taking so eager an interest in the affairs of life was practically understood without the use of her lower limbs, that her whole existence for years had been passed between the sofa, the bed, and the bath chair, in which he chatted so naturally at the dinner table. She made no allusion to her affliction until the dessert was reached, and then touching a bell, she made us a witty little speech about leaving us like time on noiseless feet, and was wheeled out of the room by the butler and carried off to her apartments at the other end of the house. And the rest of us were not long in following suit, for Dr. Silence myself were quite as eager to learn the nature of our errand as our host was to impart it to us. He led us down a long flag passage to a room at the very end of the house, a room provided with double doors and windows. I saw heavily shuttered. Books lined the walls on every side and a large desk in the bow window was piled up with volumes, some open, some shut, some showing scraps of paper stuck between the leaves and all smothered in a general cataract of untidy fool's cap and loose half sheets. My study and workroom, explained Colonel Wragg with a delightful touch of innocent pride, as though he were a very serious scholar. He placed armchairs for us around the fire. Here, he added, significantly, we shall be safe from interruption and can talk securely. During dinner, the manner of the doctor had been all that was natural and spontaneous, though it was impossible for me, knowing him as I did, not to be aware that he was subconsciously very keenly alert and already receiving upon the ultra-sensitive surface of his mind various and vivid impressions, and there was now something in the gravity of his face, as well as in the significant tone of Colonel Wragg's speech, and something, too, in the fact that we three were shut away in this private chamber, about to listen to things probably strange and certainly mysterious, 
something in all this that touched my imagination sharply and sent an undeniable thrill along my nerves. Taking the chair indicated by my host, I lit my cigar and waited for the opening of the attack, fully conscious that we were now too far gone in the adventure to admit a withdrawal and wondering a little anxiously where it was going to lead. What I expected precisely, it is hard to say. Nothing definite, perhaps, only the sudden change was dramatic. A few hours before, the prosaic atmosphere of Piccadilly was about me, and I was sitting in a secret chamber of this remote old building, waiting to hear an account of things that had possibly the genuine heart of terror. I thought of the dreary moor and hills outside, and the dark pines copses sowing in the wind of night. I remembered my companion's singular words up in my bedroom before dinner, and then I turned and noted carefully the stern countenance of the colonel as he faced us and lit his big black cigar before speaking. The threshold of an adventure, I reflected, as I waited for the first words, is always the most thrilling moment until the climax comes. But Colonel Wragg hesitated, mentally, a long time before he began. He talked briefly of our journey, the weather, the country, and other comparatively trivial topics, while he sought about his mind for an appropriate entry into the subject that was uppermost in the thoughts of all of us. The fact was he found it difficult to speak of it at all, and it was Dr. Silence who finally showed him the way over the hedge. Mr. Hubbard will take a few notes when you are ready. You won't object, he suggested. I can give you my undivided attention in this way. By all means, turning to reach some of the loose sheets on the writing table and glancing at me, he still hesitated a little, I thought. The fact is, he said apologetically, I wondered if it was quite fair to trouble you so soon. The daylight might suit you better to hear what I have to tell. Your sleep, I mean, might be less disturbed, perhaps. I appreciate your thoughtfulness, John Silence replied with his gentle smile, taking command as if it were from that moment. But really, we are both quite immune. There is nothing, I think, that could prevent either of us sleeping except an outbreak of fire or some such very physical disturbance. Colonel Wragg raised his eyes and looked fixedly at him. This reference to an outbreak of fire, I felt sure, was made with a purpose. It certainly had the desired effect of removing from our host's manner the last signs of hesitancy. Forgive me, he said. Of course, I know nothing of your methods in matters of this kind, so perhaps you would like me to begin at once and give you an outline of the situation. Dr. Silence bowed his agreement. I can then make my precautions accordingly, he added calmly. The soldier looked up for a moment as though he did not quite gather the meaning of these words, but he made no further comment and turned at once to tackle a subject on which he evidently talked with diffidence and unwillingness. It's also utterly out of my line of things, he began, puffing out clouds of cigar smoke between his words, and there's so little to tell with any real evidence behind it that it's almost impossible to make a consecutive story for you. It's a total cumulative effect that is so, so disquieting. He chose his words with care, as though determined not to travel one hair's breadth beyond the truth. I came into this place twenty years ago, when my elder brother died, he continued, but could not afford to live here then. My sister, whom you met at dinner, kept house for him till the end, and during all these years, while I was seeing service abroad, she had an eye to the place, for we never got a satisfactory tenant, and saw that it was not allowed to go to ruin. I myself took possession, however, only a year ago. My brother, he went on, after a perceptible pause, spent much of his time away too. He was a great traveler and filled the house with stuff he brought home from all over the world. The laundry, a small detached building beyond the servant's quarter, he turned into a regular little museum. The curios and things I have cleared away. They collected dust and were always getting broken, but the laundry house you shall see tomorrow. Colonel Wragg spoke with such deliberation, with so many pauses, that this beginning took him a long time, but at this point he came to a full stop altogether. Evidently, there was something he wished to say that cost him considerable effort. At length he looked up steadily into my companion's face. May I ask you, that is, if you won't think it strange, he said, and a sort of hush came over his voice and manner, whether you have noticed anything at all unusual, anything queer, since you came into the house. Dr. Silence answered without a moment's hesitation. I have, he said. There is a curious sensation of heat in the place. Ah, exclaimed the other, 
with a slight start. You have noticed it, this unaccountable heat. But its cause, I gather, is not in the house itself, but outside. I was astonished to hear the doctor add. Colonel Rag rose from his chair and turned to unhook a framed map that hung upon the wall. I got the impression that the movement was made with the deliberate purpose of concealing his face. Your diagnosis, I believe, is amazingly accurate, he said, after a moment turning around with the map in his hands, though of course I can have no idea how you should guess. John Sanis shrugged his shoulders expressively. Merely my impression, he said. If you pay attention to impressions and do not allow them to be confused by deductions of the intellect, you often find them surprisingly uncannily accurate. Colonel Rag resumed his seat and laid the map upon his knees. His face was very thoughtful as he plunged abruptly again into his story. On coming into possession, he said, looking at us alternately in the face, I found a crop of stories of the most extraordinary and impossible kind I had ever heard. Stories which at first I treated with amused indifference, but later was forced to regard seriously, if only to keep my servants. These stories, I thought, I traced the fact of my brother's death, and in a way, I think so still. He leant forward and handed the map to Dr. Silence. It's an old plan of the estate, he explained, but accurate enough for our purpose, and I wish you would note the position of the plantations marked upon it, especially those near the house. That one, indicating the spot with his finger, is called the Twelve Acre Plantation. It was just there, on the side nearest the house, that my brother and the headkeeper met their deaths. He spoke as a man forced to recognize facts that he deplored and would have preferred to leave untouched, things he personally would rather have treated with ridicule if possible. It made his words peculiarly dignified and impressive, and I listened with an increasing uneasiness as to the sort of help the doctor would look to me for later. It seemed as though I were a spectator of some drama of mystery in which any moment I might be summoned to play a part. It was 20 years ago, continued the colonel, but there was much talk about it at the time, unfortunately, and you may perhaps have heard of the affair. Stride the Keeper was a passionate, hot-tempered man, but I regret to say so was my brother, and quarrels between them seemed to have been frequent. I do not recall the affair, said the doctor. May I ask what was the cause of death? Something in his voice made me prick up my ears for the reply. The Keeper, it was said from suffocation, and at the inquest, the doctors averred that both men had been dead the same length of time when found. And your brother, asked John Silence, noticing the omission and listening intently. Equally mysterious, said our host, speaking in a low voice with effort. But there was one distressing feature I think I ought to mention. For those who saw the face, I did not see it myself. And though Stride carried a gun, his chambers were undischarged. He stammered and hesitated with confusion. Again, that sense of terror moved between his words. He stuck. Yes, said the chief listener sympathetically. My brother's face, they said, looked as though it had been scorched. It had been swept, as it were, by something that burned, blasted. It was, I'm told, quite dreadful. The bodies were found, lying side by side, faces downward, both pointing away from the wood, as though they had been in the act of running, and not more than a dozen yards from its edge. Dr. Silence made no comment. He appeared to be studying the map attentively. I did not see the face myself, repeated the other, his manner somehow expressing the sense of awe he contrived to keep out of his voice. But my sister unfortunately did, and her present state, I believe, to be entirely due to the shock it gave to her nerves. She never can be brought to refer to it. Naturally, and I'm even inclined to think that the memory has mercifully been permitted to vanish from her mind. But she spoke of it at the time as a face swept by flame, blasted. John Silence looked up from his contemplation of the map, but with the air one who wished to listen, not to speak, and presently Colonel Wragg went on with his account. He stood on the mat, his broad shoulders hiding most of the mantelpiece. They all centered about this particular plantation, these stories, that was to be expected, for the people here are as superstitious as Irish peasantry, and though I made one or two examples among them to stop the foolish talk, it had no effect, and new versions came to my ears every week. 
You may imagine how little good dismissals did when I tell you that the servants dismissed themselves. It was not the house servants, but the men who worked on the estate outside. The keepers gave notice one after another, none of them with any reason I could accept. The foresters refused to enter the wood and the beaters to beat in it. Word flew all over the countryside that 12-acre plantation was a place to be avoided day or night. There came a point, the colonel went on, now well in his swing, when I felt compelled to make investigations on my own account. I could not kill the thing by ignoring it, so I collected and analyzed the stories at first hand. For this 12-acre wood, you will see by the map, comes rather near home. Its lower end, if you will look, almost touches the end of the back lawn, as I will show you tomorrow, and its dense growth of pines form the chief protection the house enjoys from the east winds that blow up from the sea. And in olden days, before my brother interfered with it and frightened all the game away, it was one of the best pheasant coverts on the whole estate. And what form, if I may ask, did this interference take, asked Dr. Silence. In detail, I cannot tell you, for I do not know, except that I understand it was a subject of his frequent differences with the head keeper. But during the last two years of his life, when he gave up traveling and settled down here, he took a special interest in this wood, and for some unaccountable reason began to build a low stone wall round it. This wall was never finished, but you shall see the ruins tomorrow in the daylight. And the result of your investigations, these stories I mean, the doctor broke in, anxious to keep him to the main issues. Yes, I'm coming to that, he said slowly. But the word first, for this wood out of which they grew like mushrooms has nothing in any way peculiar about it. It is very thickly grown and rises to a clearer part in the center, a sort of mound. There is a circle of large boulders, old druid stones, I'm told. At another place there's a small pond. There's nothing distinctive about it that I could mention. Just an ordinary pine wood, a very ordinary pine wood. Only the trees are a bit twisted in the trunks, some of them, and very dense, nothing more. And the stories? Well, none of them had anything to do with my poor brother or the keeper, as you might have expected. And they were all odd, such odd things, I mean, to invent or imagine. I never could make out how these people got such notions into their heads. He paused a moment to relight his cigar. There's no regular path through it, he resumed, puffing vigorously, but the fields around it are constantly used, and one of the gardeners whose cottage lies over that way declared he often saw moving lights in it at night, and luminous shapes like globes of fire over the tops of the trees, skimming and floating and making a soft hissing sound. Most of them said that in fact, another man saw shapes flitting in and out among the trees, things that were neither men nor animals, and all faintly luminous. No one ever pretended to see human forms. Always queer, huge things they could not properly describe. Sometimes the whole wood was lit up. And one fellow, he's still here, and you shall see him, has a most circumstantial yarn about having seen great stars lying on the ground round the edge of the wood at regular intervals. What kind of stars? Put in John's silence sharply, in a sudden way that made me start. Oh, I don't know quite... Ordinary stars, I think, he said, only very large and apparently blazing as though the ground was alight. He was too terrified to go close and examine, and he has never seen them since. He stooped and stirred the fire into a welcome blaze, welcome for its blaze of light rather than for its heat. In the room there was already a strange pervading sensation of warmth that was oppressive in its effect and far from comforting. Of course, he went on straightening up again on the mat, this was all commonplace enough, this seeing light and figures at night. Most of these fellows drink, and imagination and terror between them may account for almost anything. But others saw things in broad daylight. One of the woodmen, a sober, respectable man, took the shortcut home to his midday meal and swore he was followed the whole length of the wood by something that never showed itself, but dodged from tree to tree, always keeping out of sight. It's solid enough to make the branches sway and the twigs snap on the ground, and it made a noise, he declared. But really, the speaker stopped and gave a short laugh. It's too absurd. Please, insisted the doctor, for it is these small details that give me the best clues always. It made a crackling noise, he said, like a bonfire. Those were his very words, 
like the crackling of a bonfire, finished the soldier with a repetition of his short laugh. Most interesting, Dr. Silence observed gravely. Please omit nothing. Yes, he went on. And it was soon after that the fires began, the fires in the wood. They started mysteriously burning in the patches of coarse white grass that covered the more open parts of the plantation. No one ever actually saw them start, but many, myself among the number, have seen them burning and smoldering. They are always small and circular in shape, and for all the world like a picnic fire. The head keeper has a dozen explanations, from sparks flying out of the house chimneys to the sunlight focusing through a dewdrop. But none of them, I must admit, convince me as being in the least likely or probable. They are most singular, I consider most singular, these mysterious fires, and I am glad to say that they come only at rather long intervals and never seem to spread. But the keeper had other queer stories as well, and about things that are verifiable. He declared that no life ever willingly entered the plantation, more that no life existed in it at all. No birds nested in the trees or flew into their shade. He set countless traps, but never caught so much as a rabbit or a weasel. Animals avoided it, and more than once he had picked up dead creatures round the edges that bore no obvious signs of how they had met their death. Moreover, he told me one extraordinary tale about his retriever chasing some invisible creature across the field one day when he was out with his gun. The dog suddenly pointed at something in the field at its feet and then gave chase yelping like a mad thing. It followed its imaginary quarry to the borders of the wood and then went in, a thing he had never known it to do before. The moment it crossed the edge, it is darkish in there, even in daylight. It began fighting in the most frenzied and terrific fashion. It made him afraid to interfere, he said, and at last, when the dog came out, hanging its tail down and panting, he found something like white hair stuck to his jaws and brought it to show me. I tell you these details because they are important, believe me. The doctor stopped him. And you have it still, this hair? he asked. It disappeared in the oddest way, the colonel explained. It was curious looking stuff, something like asbestos, and I sent it to be analyzed by the local chemist. But either the man got wind of its origin or else he didn't like the look of it for some reason because he returned it to me and said it was neither animal, vegetable, nor mineral. So as far as he could make out, and he didn't wish to have anything to do with it, I put it away in paper, but a week later, on opening the package, it was gone. Oh, the stories are simply endless. I could tell you hundreds, all in the same lines. And personal experiences of your own, Colonel Ragg asked John Silence earnestly, his manner showing the greatest possible interest and sympathy. The soldier gave an almost imperceptible start. He looked distinctly uncomfortable. Nothing, I think, he said slowly. Nothing I should like to rely on. I mean, nothing I have the right to speak of, perhaps, yet. His mouth closed with a snap. Dr. Silence, after waiting a little to see if he would add to his reply, did not seek to press him on the point. While he resumed presently, and as though he would speak contemptuously, yet dared not. This sort of thing has gone on at intervals ever since. It spreads like wildfire, of course mysterious chatter of this kind, and people began trespassing all over the estate, coming to see the wood and making themselves a general nuisance. Notices of man traps and spring guns only seemed to increase their persistence. And think of it, he snorted. Some local research society actually wrote and asked permission for one of their members to spend the night in the wood. Older fools, who didn't write for leave, came and took away bits of bark from the trees and gave them to clairvoyants who invented in their turn a further batch of tales. There was simply no end to it at all. Most distressing and annoying, I can well believe, interposed the doctor. Then suddenly the phenomena ceased, as mysterious as they had begun, and the interest flagged. The tales stopped. People got interested in something else. It all seemed to die out. This was last July. I can tell you exactly, for I've kept a diary, more or less, of what happened. Ah. But now, quite recently, within the past three weeks, it has all revived again, with a rush, with a kind of furious attack, so to speak, it has really become unbearable. You may imagine what it means, and the general state of affairs when I say that the possibility 
of leaving has occurred to me. Incendiarism, suggested Dr. Silence, half under his breath, but not so low that Colonel Wright did not hear me. By Jove, sir, you take the very words out of my mouth, exclaimed the astonished man, glancing from the doctor to me and from me to the doctor, and rattling the money in his pocket as though some explanation of my friend's divining powers were to be found that way. It's only that you are thinking very vividly, the doctor said quietly, and your thoughts form pictures in my mind before you utter them. It's merely a little elementary thought reading. His intention, I saw, was not to perplex the good man, but to impress him with his power so as to ensure obedience later. Good Lord, I had no idea. He did not finish the sentence and dived again abruptly into his narrative. I did not see anything myself. I must admit, but the stories of independent eyewitnesses were to the effect that lines of light, like streams of thin fire, moved through the woods and sometimes were seen to shoot out precisely as flames might shoot out in the direction of the house. There, he explained, in a louder voice that made me jump, pointing with a thick finger to the map, where the westerly fringe of the plantation comes up to the end of the lower lawn at the back of the house, where it links up to those dark patches, which are laurel shrubberies, running right up to the back premises. That's where these lights were seen. They passed from the wood to the shrubberies, and in this way reached the house itself. Like silent rockets, one man described them, rapid as lightning and exceedingly bright. And this evidence you spoke of? They actually reached the sides of the house. They have left a mark of scorching on the walls, the walls of the laundry building at the other end. You shall see them tomorrow. He pointed to the map to indicate the spot, and then straightened himself and glared about the room as though he had said something no one could believe an expected contradiction. Scorched, just as the faces were, the doctor murmured, looking significantly at me. Scorched, yes, repeated the colonel, failing to catch the rest of the sentence in his excitement. There was a prolonged silence in the room in which I heard the gurgling of the oil in the lamp and the click of the coals and the heavy breathing of our host. The most unwelcome sensations were creeping about my spine, and I wondered whether my companion would scorn me utterly if I asked to sleep on the sofa in his room. It was eleven o'clock. I saw by the clock on the mantelpiece. We had crossed the dividing line and were now well in the movement of the adventure. The fight between my interest and my dread became acute, but even if turning back had been impossible, I think the interest would have easily gained a day. I have enemies, of course, I heard the colonel's rough voice break into the pause presently and have discharged a number of servants. It's not that, put in John's silence briefly. You think not? In a sense, I'm glad, and yet there are some things that can be met and dealt with. He left the sentence unfinished and looked down at the floor with an expression of grim severity that betrayed a momentary glimpse of character. This fighting man loathed and abhorred the thought of an enemy he could not see and come to grips with. Presently he moved over and sat down in the chair between us. Something like a sigh escaped him. Dr. Silence said nothing. My sister, of course, is kept in ignorance as far as possible of all this, he said disconnectedly, and as if talking to himself. But even if she knew, she would find matter of fact explanations. I only wish I could. I'm sure they exist. There came an interval in the conversation that was very significant. It did not seem a real pause or the silence, real silence, for both men continued to think so rapidly and strongly that one almost imagined their thoughts, clothed themselves in words in the air of the room. I was more than a little keyed up with a strange excitement of all I had heard, but what stimulated my nerves more than anything else was the obvious fact that the doctor was clearly upon the trail of discovery. In his mind at that moment, I believe, he had already solved the nature of this perplexing psychical problem. His face was like a mask, and he employed the absolute minimum of gestures and words. All his energies were directed inwards, and by those uncalculable methods and processes he had mastered with such infinite patience and study, I felt sure he had already in, been in touch with the forces behind these singular phenomena, and laying his deep plans for bringing them into the open and then effectively dealing with them. Colonel Ragg, meanwhile, grew more and more fidgety. From time to time, he turned towards my companion, 
as though about to speak, yet always changing his mind at the last moment. Once he went over and opened the door suddenly, apparently to see if anyone were listening at the keyhole, for he disappeared a moment between the two doors. Then I heard him open the outer one. He stood there for some seconds and made a noise as though he was sniffing the air like a dog. Then he closed both doors cautiously and came back to the fireplace. A strange excitement seemed growing upon him. Evidently, he was trying to make up his mind to say something that he found difficult to say. And John Silence, as I rightly judged, was waiting patiently for him to choose his own opportunity and his own way of saying it. At last he turned and faced us, squaring his great shoulders and stiffening perceptibly. Dr. Silence looked up sympathetically. Your own experience helps me most, he observed quietly. The fact is, the colonel said, speaking very low, this past week, there have been outbreaks of fire in the house itself, three separate outbreaks and all in my sister's room. Yes, the doctor said, as if this was just what he had expected to hear. Utterly unaccountable, all of them, added the other, and then sat down. I began to understand something of the reason of his excitement. He was realizing at last that the natural explanation he had held to all along was becoming impossible, and he hated it. It made him angry. Fortunately, he went on, she was out each time and does not know, but I have made her sleep now in a room on the ground floor. A wise precaution, the doctor said simply. He asked one or two questions. The fires had started in the curtains, once by the window and once by the bed. The third time smoke had been discovered by the maid coming from the cupboard, and it was found that Miss Rag's clothes hanging on the hooks were smoldering. The doctor listened attentively, but made no comment. And now, can you tell me, he said presently, what your own feeling about it is, your general impression? It sounds foolish to say so, replied the soldier, after a moment's hesitation, but I feel exactly as often felt on active service in my Indian campaigns, just as if the house and all in it were in a state of siege, as though a concealed enemy were encamped about us, in ambush somewhere. He uttered a soft, nervous laugh, as if the next sign of smoke would precipitate a panic, a dreadful panic. The picture came before me of the night shadowing the house and the twisted pine trees he had described crowding about it, concealing some powerful enemy and glancing at the resolute face and figure of the old soldier. Forced at length to his confession, I understood something of all he had been through before he sought the assistance of John Silence. And tomorrow, unless I am mistaken, is full moon, said the doctor suddenly, watching the other's face for the effect of his apparently careless words. Colonel Rye gave an uncontrollable start, and his face for the first time showed unmistakable pallor. What in the world, he began, his lip quivering, only that I am beginning to see light in this extraordinary affair, returned the doctor calmly, and if my theory is correct, each month when the moon is at the full, should witness an increase in the activity of the phenomena. I don't see the connection, Colonel Rag answered almost savagely, but I'm bound to say my diary bears you out. He wore the most puzzled expression I've ever seen upon an honest face, but he abhorred this additional corroboration of an explanation that perplexed him. I confess, he repeated, I cannot see the connection. Why should you, said the doctor, with his first laugh that evening. He got up and hung the map upon the wall again. But I do, because these things are my special study. And let me add that I have yet to come across a problem that is not natural and has not a natural explanation. It's merely a question of how much one knows and admits. Colonel Rag eyed him with a new and curious respect in his face. But his feelings were soothed moreover the doctor's laugh and change of manner came as a relief to all and broke the spell of grave suspense that had held us so long. We all rose and stretched our limbs and took little walks about the room. I am glad, Dr. Silence, if you allow me to say so, that you are here, he said simply. Very glad indeed, and now I fear I have kept you both up very late, with a glance to include me, for you must be tired and ready for your beds. I have told you all there is to tell, he added, and tomorrow you must feel perfectly free to take any steps you think necessary. The end was abrupt yet natural, for there was nothing more to say, and neither of these men talked for mere talking's sake. On the cold and chilly hall, he lit our candles and took us upstairs. 
The house was at rest and still, everyone asleep. We moved softly. Through the windows on the stairs we saw the moonlight falling across the lawn, throwing deep shadows. The near pine trees were just visible in the distance, a wall of impenetrable blackness. Our host came for a moment to our rooms to see that we had everything. He pointed to a coil of strong rope lying beside the window, fastened to the wall by means of an iron ring. Evidently, it had been recently put in. I don't think we shall need it, Dr. Silence said with a smile. I trust not, replied our host gravely. I sleep quite close to you across the land, he whispered, pointing to his door. And if you, if you want anything in the night, you will know where to find me. He wished us pleasant dreams and disappeared down the passage, into his room, shading the candle with his big muscular hand from the draught. John Silence stopped me a moment before I went. You know what it is, I asked, with an excitement that even overcame my weariness. Yes, he said. I'm almost sure. And you? Not the smallest notion. He looked disappointed, but not half as disappointed as I felt. Egypt, he whispered. Egypt. Part 2 Nothing happened to disturb me in the night. Nothing, that is, except the nightmare in which Colonel Ragg chased me amid thin streaks of fire and his sister always prevented my escape by suddenly rising up out of the ground in her chair, dead. The deep bang of dogs woke me once just before the dawn. It must have been for I saw the window frame against the sky. There was a flash of lightning too, I thought, as I turned over in bed, and it was warm for October, oppressively warm. It was after eleven o'clock when our host suggested going out with the guns. These we understood being a somewhat thin disguise for our true purpose. Personally, I was glad to be in the open air, for the atmosphere of the house was heavy with presentiment. The sense of impending disaster hung over all. Fear stalked the passages and lurked in the corners of every room. It was a house haunted, but really haunted, not by some vague shadow of the dead, but by a definite though incalculable influence that was actively alive and dangerous. At the least smell of smoke, the entire household quivered. An odor of burning, I was convinced, would paralyze all the inmates, for the servants, though professedly ignorant by the master's unspoken orders, yet shared the common dread and the hideous uncertainty, joined with his display of so spiteful and calculated a spirit of malignity, provided a kind of black doom that draped not only the walls, but also the minds of the people living within them. Only the bright and cheerful vision of old Miss Bragg being pushed about the house in her noiseless chair, chatting and nodding briskly to everyone she met prevented us from giving away entirely to the depression which governed the majority. The sight of her was like a gleam of sunshine through the depths of some ill-omened wood. And just as we went out, I saw her being wheeled along by her attendant into the sunshine of the back lawn and caught her cheery smile as she turned her head and wished us good sport. The morning was October at its best. Sunshine glistened on the dew-drenched grass and on leaves turned golden red. The dainty messengers of coming hoarfrost were already in the air, a search for permanent winter quarters. From the wide moors that everywhere swept up against the sky, like a purple sea splashed by the occasional gray of rocky clefts, there stole down the cool and perfumed wind of the west, and the keen taste of the sea ran through all like a master flavor worn over the spaces perhaps by the seagulls that circled and cried high in the air. But our host took little interest in the sparkling beauty and had no thought of showing off the scenery of his property. His mind was otherwise intent, and for that matter, so were our own. Those bleak moors and hills stretched unbroken for hours, he said, with a sweep of the hand, and over there, some four miles pointing in another direction, lies the bay, a long swampy inlet of the sea, haunted by myriads of seabirds. On the other side of the house are the plantations and pine woods. I thought we would get the dogs and go first to the twelve-acre wood I told you about last night. It's quite near. We found the dogs in the stable and I recalled the deep baying of the night when a fine bloodhound in two great danes leaped out to greet us. Singular companions for guns, I thought to myself, as we struck out across the fields and the great creatures bounded and ran beside us, nose to ground. The conversation was scanty. 
John San's grave face did not encourage talk. He wore the expression I knew well, that look of earnest solicitude, which meant that his whole being was deeply absorbed and preoccupied. Frightened, I had never seen him, but anxious often. It always moved me to witness it, and he was anxious now. On the way back, you shall see the laundry building, Colonel Ragg observed shortly, for he too found little to say. We shall attract less attention then. Yet not all the crisp beauty of the morning seemed able to dispel the feelings of uneasy dread that gathered increasingly about our minds as we went. In a very few minutes, a clump of pine trees concealed the house from view, and we found ourselves on the outskirts of a densely grown plantation of conifers. Colonel Ragg stopped abruptly and producing a map from his pocket explained once more very briefly its position with regard to the house he showed how it ran up almost to the walls of the laundry building though at the moment beyond our actual view and pointed to the windows of his sister's bedroom where the fires had been the room now empty looked straight on to the wood then glancing nervously about him and calling the dogs to heel he proposed that we should enter the plantation and make as thorough examination of it as were thought worthwhile the dogs, he added, might perhaps be persuaded to accompany us a little way, and he pointed to where they cowered at his feet, but he doubted it. Neither voice nor will will get them very far, I'm afraid, he said. I know by experience. If you have no objections, replied Dr. Silence, with decision and speaking almost for the first time, we will make our examination alone, Mr. Hubbard and myself. It will be best so. His tone was absolutely final, and the colonel agreed so politely that even a little less intuitive man than myself might have seen that he was genuinely relieved. You doubtless have good reasons, he said. Merely that I wish to obtain my impression uncolored. This delicate clue I am working on might be so easily blurred by the thought currents of another mind with strongly preconceived ideas. Perfectly, I understand, rejoined the soldier, though with an expression of countenance that plainly contradicted his words. Then I will wait here with the dogs and we'll have a look at the laundry on our way home. I turned once to look back as we clambered over the low stone wall built by the late owner and saw his straight soldierly figure standing in the sunlit field watching us with a curiously intent look on his face. It was something to me incongruous, just distinctly pathetic in the man's efforts to meet all far-fetched explanations of the mystery with contempt and at the same time, in a stolid, unswerving investigation of it all, he nodded at me and made a gesture of farewell with his hand. That picture of him standing in the sunshine with his big dog steadily watching us remains with me to this day. Dr. Silence led the way in among the twisted trunks, planted closely together in serried ranks, and I followed sharp at his heels. The moment we were out of sight, he turned and put down his gun against the roots of a big tree, and I did likewise. We shall hardly want these cumbersome weapons of murder, he observed with a passing smile. You are sure of your clue, then? I asked at once, bursting with curiosity, yet fearing to betray it lest he should think me unworthy. His own methods were absolutely simple and untheatrical. I am sure of my clue, he answered gravely, and I think we have come just in time. You shall know in due course. For the present, be content to follow and observe, and think steadily. The support of your mind will help me. His voice had that quiet mastery in it which leads men to face death with a sort of happiness and pride. I would have followed him anywhere at that moment. At the same time, his words conveyed a sense of dread seriousness. I caught the thrill of his confidence, but also in this broad daylight, I felt the measure of alarm that lay behind. You still have no strong impressions, he asked. Nothing happened in the night, for instance? No vivid dreamings? He looked closely for my answer. I was aware. I slept almost in unbroken sleep. I was tremendously tired, you know. And for the oppressive heat. Good. You still notice the heat then, he said to himself, rather than expecting an answer. And the lightning, he added. That lightning out of a clear day, that flashing. Did you notice that? I answered truly that I thought I had seen a flash during a moment of wakefulness. And then he drew my attention to certain facts before moving on. You remember the sensation of warmth when you put the letter to your forehead in the train, the heat generally in the house last evening, and as you now mentioned in the night, you heard too the colonel's stories about the appearance of fire 
in this wood and in the house itself and the way his brother and the gamekeeper came to their deaths 20 years ago? I nodded, wondering what in the world it all meant. And you get no clue from these facts? He asked, a trifle surprised. I searched every corner of my mind and imagination for some inkling of his meaning, but was obliged to admit that I understood nothing so far. Never mind, you will later. And now, he added, we will go over the wood and see what we can find. His words explained to me something of his method. We were to keep our minds alert and report to each other the least fancy that crossed the picture gallery of our thoughts. Then, just as we started, he turned again to me with a final warning. And for your safety, he said earnestly. Imagine now, and for that matter, imagine always until we leave this place. Imagine with the utmost keenness that you are surrounded by a shell that protects you. Picture yourself inside a protective envelope and build it up with the most intense imagination you can evoke. Pour the whole force of your thought and will into it. Believe vividly all through this adventure that such a shell constructed of your thought, will, and imagination surrounds you completely and that nothing can pierce it to attack. He spoke with dramatic conviction, gazing hard at me as though to enforce his meaning, and then moved forward and began to pick his way over the rough, tasaki ground into the wood, and meanwhile, knowing the efficacy of his prescription, I adopted it to the best of my ability. The trees at once closed about us like the night. Their branches met overhead in a continuous tangle. Their stems crept closer and closer. The brambly undergrowth thickened and multiplied. We tore our trousers, scratched our hands, and our eyes filled with fine dust that made it most difficult to avoid the clinging prickly network of branches and creepers. Coarse white grass that caught our feet like strings grew here and there in patches. It crowned the lumps of peaty growth that stuck up like human heads, fantastically dressed, thrusting up at us out of the ground with a crest of dead hair. We stumbled and floundered among them. It was hard going, and I could well conceive it impossible to find a way at all in the night time. We jumped, when possible, from tussock to tussock, and it seemed as though we were springing among heads on a battlefield, and that this dead white grass concealed eyes that turned to stare as we passed. Here and there the sunlight shot in with vivid spots of white light, dazzling the sight but only making the surrounding gloom deeper by contrast, and on two occasions we passed dark circular places in the grass where fires had eaten their mark and left a ring of ashes. Dr. Silence pointed to them, but without comment and without pausing, and the sight of them woke in me a singular realization of the dread that lay so far, only just out of sight in this adventure. It was exhausting work, and heavy going. We kept close together. The warmth, too, was extraordinary, yet it did not seem the warmth of the body due to violent exertion, but rather an inner heat of the mind that laid glowing hands of fire upon the heart and set the brain in a kind of steady blaze. When my companion found himself too far in advance, he waited for me to come up. The place had evidently been untouched by hand of man, keeper, forester, or sportsman for many a year, and my thoughts, as we advanced painfully, went on like the state of the wood itself, dark, confused, full of a haunting wonder and the shadow of fear. By this time, all signs of the open field behind us were hid. No single gleam penetrated. We might have been groping in the heart of some primeval forest. Then suddenly the brambles and tussocks and string-like grass came to an end. The trees opened out and the ground began to slope upward towards a large central mound. We had reached the middle of the plantation and before stood the broken druid stones our host had mentioned. We walked easily up the little hill between the sparser stems and resting upon one of the ivy-covered boulders, looked round upon a comparatively open space, as large perhaps as a small London square. Thinking of the ceremonies and sacrifices this rough circle of prehistoric monoliths might have witnessed, I looked up into my companion's face with an unspoken question, but he read my thought and shook his head. Our mystery has nothing to do with these dead symbols, he said, with something perhaps even more ancient and of another country altogether. Egypt, I said, half under my breath, hopelessly puzzled but recalling his words in my bedroom. He nodded. Mentally, I still floundered, 
but he seemed intensely preoccupied, and it was no time for asking questions. So as the words circled unintelligibly in my mind, I looked round at the scene before me, glad of the opportunity to recover breath and some measure of composure. But hardly had I time to notice the twisted and contorted shapes of many of the pine trees close at hand when Dr. Silence leaned over and touched me on the shoulder. He pointed down the slope, and the look I saw in his eyes keyed up every nerve in my body to its utmost pitch. A thin, almost imperceptible calm of blue smoke was rising among the trees some twenty yards away at the foot of the mound. It curled up and up and disappeared from sight among the tangled branches overhead. It was scarcely thicker than the smoke from a small brand of burning wood. Protect yourself. Imagine yourself strongly, whispered the doctor sharply, and follow me closely. He rose at once and moved swiftly down the slope towards the smoke, and I followed, afraid to remain alone. I heard the soft crunching of our steps on the pine needles. Over his shoulder I watched the thin blue spiral, without once taking my eyes off it. I hardly know how to describe the peculiar sense of vague horror inspired in me by the sight of that streak of smoke penciling its way upward among the dark trees, and the sensation of increasing heat as we approached was phenomenal. It was like walking towards a glowing yet invisible fire. As we drew nearer, his pace slackened. Then he stopped and pointed, and I saw a small circle of burnt grass upon the ground. The tussocks were blackened and smoldering, and from the center rose this line of smoke, pale blue steady. Then I noticed a movement of the atmosphere besides us, as if the warm air were rising and the cool air rushing in to take its place, a little center of wind in the stillness. Overhead, the bows stirred and trebled where the smoke disappeared. Otherwise, not a tree sighed, not a sound made itself heard. The wood was still as a graveyard. A horrible idea came to me, that the course of nature was about to change without warning, had changed a little already, that the sky would drop or the surface of the earth crash inwards like a broken bubble. Something certainly reached up to the citadel of my reason, causing its throne to shake. John's silence moved forward again. I could not see his face, but his attitude was plainly one of resolution, of muscle and mind, ready for vigorous action. We were within ten feet of the blackened circle when the smoke of a sudden ceased to rise and vanish. The tail of the column disappeared in the air above, and at the same instant it seemed to me that the sensation of heat passed from my face and the motion of the wind was gone. The calm spirit of the fresh October day resumed command. Side by side we advanced and examined the place. The grass was smoldering, the ground still hot. The circle of burned earth was a foot to a foot and a half in diameter. It looked like an ordinary picnic fireplace. I bent down cautiously to look, but in a second I sprang back with an involuntary cry of alarm. For as the doctor stamped on the ashes to prevent them spreading, a sound of hissing rose from the spot, as though he had kicked a living creature. This hissing was faintly audible in the air. It moved past us, away towards the thicker portion of the wood, in the direction of our field, and in a second Dr. Silence had left the fire and started in pursuit, and then began a most extraordinary hunt of invisibility I can ever conceive. He went fast, even at the beginning, and of course it was perfectly obvious that he was following something. To judge by the poise of his head, he kept his eyes steadily at a certain level, just above the height of a man, and the consequence was he stumbled a good deal over the roughness of the ground. The hissing sound had stopped. There was no sound of any kind, and what he sought to follow was utterly beyond me. I only know that in mortal dread of being left behind, and with abiding curiosity, to see whatever there was to be seen, I followed as quickly as I could, and even then barely succeeded in keeping up with him. And as we went, the whole mad jumble of the colonel's stories ran through my brain, touching a sense of frightened laughter that was only held in check by the sight of this earnest, hurrying figure before me. For John's silence at work inspired me with a kind of awe. He looked so diminutive among these giant twisted trees, while yet I knew that his purpose and his knowledge were so great, and even in hurry, he was dignified. The fancy that we were playing some queer, exaggerated game together met the fact that we were two men dancing upon the brink of some possible tragedy, and the mingling of the two emotions in my mind was both grotesque and terrifying. He never turned 
in his mad chase, but pushed rapidly on, while I panted after him like a figure in some unreasoning nightmare. And as I ran, it came upon me that he had been aware all the time, in his quiet, internal way, of many things that he had kept for his own secret consideration. We had been watching, waiting, planning from the very moment we entered the shade of the wood, by some inner concentrated process of mind, dynamic if not actually magical, he had been in direct contact with the source of the whole adventure, the very essence of the real mystery, and other forces were moving to a climax. Something was about to happen, something important, something possibly dreadful. Every nerve, every sense, every significant gesture of the plunging figure before me proclaimed the fact that just as surely as the skies, the winds and the face of the earth tell the birds the time to migrate and warn the animals that danger lurks and they must move. In a few moments, we reached the foot of the mound and entered the tangled undergrowth that lay between us and the sunlight of the field. Here the difficulties of fast traveling increased a hundredfold. There were brambles to dodge, low boughs to dive under, and countless tree trunks closing up to make a direct path impossible. Yet Dr. Silence never seemed to falter or hesitate. He went diving, jumping, dodging, ducking, but ever in the same main direction, following a clean trail. Twice I tripped and fell, and both times when I picked myself up again, I saw him ahead of me, still forcing away like a dog after its quarry. And sometimes like a dog, he stopped and pointed. Human pointing it was, psychic pointing. And each time he stopped to point, I heard that faint high hissing in the air beyond us. The instinct of an infallible dowser possessed him and he made no mistakes. At length, abruptly, I caught up with him and found that we stood at the edge of the shallow pond Colonel Ragg had mentioned in his account the night before. It was long and narrow, filled with dark brown water, in which the trees were dimly reflected, not a ripple stirred its surface. Watch, he cried out as I came up. It's going to cross. It's bound to betray itself. The water is its natural enemy, and we shall see the direction. And even as he spoke, a thin line, like the track of a water spider, shot swiftly across the shiny surface. There was a ghost of steam in the air above, and immediately I became aware of an odor of burning. Dr. Silence turned and shot a glance at me that made me think of lightning. I began to shake all over. Quick, he cried with excitement, to the trail again. We must run round. It's going to the house. The alarm in his voice quite terrified me. Without a false step, I dashed around the slippery banks and dived again at his heels into the sea of bushes and tree trunks. We were now in the thick of the very dense belt that ran round the outer edge of the plantation, and the field was near, yet so dark was the tangle that it was some time before the first shafts of white sunlight became visible. The doctor now ran in zigzags. He was following something that dodged and doubled quite wonderfully, yet had begun, I fancied, to move more slowly than before. Quick, he cried. In the light, we shall lose it. I still saw nothing, heard nothing, caught no suggestion of a trail. Yet this man, guided by some interior divining that seemed infallible, made no false turns, though how he failed to crash headlong into the trees has remained a mystery to me ever since. And then with a sudden rush, we found ourselves on the skirts of the woods with the open field lying in bright sunshine before our eyes. Too late, I heard him cry, a note of anguish in his voice, it's out, and by God, it's making for the house. I saw the colonel standing in the field with his dogs, where we left him, and he was bending double, peering into the wood, where he heard us running, and he straightened up like a bent whip released. John Silence dashed past, calling him to follow. We shall lose the trail in the light, I heard him cry as he ran, but quick, we may yet get there in time. That wild rush across the open field, with the dogs at our heels leaping and barking and the elderly colonel behind us running as though for his life. Shall I ever forget it? Though I had only vague ideas of the meaning of it all. I put my best foot forward and being the youngest of the three, I reached the house an easy first. I drew a panting and turned to wait for the others. But as I turned, something moving a little distance away caught my eye. In that moment, I swear I experienced the most overwhelming and singular shock of surprise and terror. I've ever known or can conceive as possible for the front door was open 
and the waist of the house being narrow, I could see through the hall into the dining room beyond, and so out onto the back lawn. And there I saw no less a sight than the figure of Miss Rag running. Even at that distance, it was plain that she had seen me and was coming fast towards me, running with a frantic gait of a terror-stricken woman. She had recovered the use of her legs. Her face was a livid gray, as of death itself, but the general expression was one of laughter, for her mouth was gaping and her eyes, always bright, shone with the light of a wild merriment that seemed the merriment of a child, it was singularly ghastly, and that very second as she fled past me to her brother's arms behind, I smelt again most unmistakably the odor of burning, and to this day the smell of smoke and fire can come very near to turning me sick with the memory of what I had seen. Fast on her heels, too, came the terrified attendant, more mistress of herself and able to speak, which the old lady could not do, but with a face almost if not quite as fearful. We were down by the bushes in the sun. She gasped and screamed and replied to Colonel Rag's distracted questionings. I was wheeling the chair as usual when she shrieked and leaped. I don't know exactly. I was too frightened to see. Oh my God, she jumped clean out of the chair and ran. There was a blast of hot air from the wood. She hit her face and jumped. She didn't make a sound. She didn't cry out or make a sound. She just ran. But the nightmare horror of it all reached the breaking point a few minutes later. And while I was still standing in the hall, temporarily bereft of speech and movement, for while the doctor, the colonel, and the attendant were halfway up the staircase, helping the fainting woman to the privacy of her room, and all in a confused group of dark figures, there sounded a voice behind me. And I turned to see the butler, his face dripping with perspiration, his eyes starting out of his head. The laundry's on fire, he cried. The laundry building's a cot. I remember his odd expression, a cot, and wanting to laugh, but finding my face rigid and inflexible. The devil's about again. So help me God, he cried, in a voice thin with terror, running about in circles. And then the group on the stairs scattered as at the sound of a shot, and the colonel and Dr. Silence came down three steps at a time, leaving the afflicted Miss Bragg to the care of her singular attendant. We were out across the front lawn in a moment, around the corner of the house, the colonel leading Silence and I at his heels, and the portly butler puffing some distance in the rear, getting more and more mixed in his addresses to God and the devil. And the moment we passed the stables and came into view of the laundry building, we saw a wicked looking volume of smoke pouring out of the narrow windows and the frightened women servants and grooms running hither and thither, calling aloud as they ran. The arrival of the master restored order instantly, and this retired soldier, poor thinker perhaps, but capable man of action, had the matter in hand from the start. He issued orders like a martinet, and almost before I could realize it, there were streaming buckets on the scene and a line of men and women formed between the building and the stable pump. Inside I heard John Silence cry, and the colonel followed him through the door, while I was just quick enough at their heels to hear him add, The smoke's the worst part of it. There's no fire yet, I think. And true enough, there was no fire. The interior was thick with smoke, but it speedily cleared, and not a single bucket was used upon the floor or walls. The air was stifling, the heat fearful. There's precious little to burn in here. It's all stone, the colonel exclaimed, coughing. But the doctor was pointing to the wooden covers of the great cauldron in which the clothes were washed, and we saw that these were smoldering and charred. And when we sprinkled half a bucket of water on them, the surrounding bricks hissed and fizzled and sent up clouds of steam. Through the open door and windows, this passed out with the rest of the smoke, and we three stood there on the brick floor staring at the spot and wondering, each in our own fashion, how in the name of natural law the place could have caught fire or smoked at all. Colonel came from the quiet pluck that faces all things yet speaks little. John Silence, from the intense mental grappling with his latest manifestation of a profound problem that called for concentration of thought rather than for any words. There was really nothing to say. The facts were indisputable. Colonel Rag was the first to utter. My sister, he said briefly and moved off. In the yard, I heard him sending the frightened servants about their business in an excellently matter-of-fact voice, scolding someone roundly for making such a big fire and letting the flues get overheated and paying no heed to the stammering reply that no fire had been lit there for several days. Then he dispatched the groom on horseback for the local doctor. 
Ben Doctor Silence turned and looked at me. The absolute control he possessed, not only over the outward expression of emotion by gesture, change of color, light in the eyes, and so forth, but also, as I well knew, over its very birth in his heart, the mask-like face of the dead he could assume at will, made it extremely difficult to know at any given moment what was at work in his inner consciousness. But now, when he turned and looked at me, there was no sphinx-like expression there, but rather the keen, triumphant face of a man who has solved a dangerous and complicated problem and saw his way to a clean victory. Now, do you guess, he asked quietly, as though it were the simplest matter in the world, and ignorance were impossible. I could only stare stupidly, remain silent. He glanced down at the charred cauldron lids and traced a figure in the air with his finger. But I was too excited or too mortified, or still too dazed, perhaps, to see what it was he outlined or what it was he meant to convey. I could only go on staring and shaking my puzzled head. A fire elemental, he cried. A fire elemental of the most powerful and malignant kind. A what? thundered the voice of Colonel Rag behind us, having returned suddenly and overheard. It's a fire elemental, repeated Dr. Silence more calmly, but with a note of triumph in his voice he could not keep out. And a fire elemental enraged. The light began to dawn in my mind at last. But the colonel, who had never heard the term before, and was besides feeling considerably worked up for a plain man with all this mystery he knew not how to grapple with, the colonel stood with the most dumbfounded look ever seen on a human countenance and continued to roar and stammer and stare. And why, he began, savage with a desire to find something visible he could fight. Why, in the name of all the blazes, and then stopped as John Silence moved up and took his arm. There, my dear Colonel Rag, he said gently, you touched the heart of the whole thing. You asked, why? That is precisely a problem. He held the soldier's eyes firmly with his own, and that too, I think. We shall soon know. Come and let us talk over a plan of action. That room with the double doors, perhaps. The word action calmed him a little, and he led the way without further speech back into the house and down the long stone passage to the room where we had heard his stories on the night of our arrival. I understood from the doctor's glance that my presence would not make the interview easier for our host, and I went upstairs to my own room, shaking. But in the solitude of my room, the vivid memories of the last hour revived so mercilessly that I began to feel I should never in my whole life lose the dreadful picture of Miss Rag running that dreadful human climax after all the non-human mystery in the wood. And I was not sorry when a servant knocked at my door and said that Colonel Rag would be glad if I would join them in the little smoking room. I think it is better you should be present, was all Colonel Rag said. As I entered the room, I took the chair with my back to the window. There was still an hour before lunch, though I imagined that the usual divisions of the day hardly found a place in the thoughts of any one of us. The atmosphere of the room was what I might call electric. The colonel was positively bristling. He stood with his back to the fire, fingering an unlit black cigar, his face flushed. He was being obviously roused and ready for action. He hated this mystery. It was poisonous to his nature, and he longed to meet something face to face, something he could engage and fight. Dr. Silence, I noticed at once, was sitting before the map of the estate, which was spread upon a table. I knew by his expression the state of his mind. He was in the thick of it, all, knew it, delighted in it, was working at high pressure. He recognized my presence with a lifted eyelid and the flash of the eye, contrasted with his stillness and composure, told me volumes. I was about to explain to our host briefly what seems to me afoot in all this business, he said without looking up, when he asked that you should join us so that we can all work together. And while signifying my assent, I caught myself wondering what quality it was in the calm speech of this undemonstrative man that was so full of power, so charged with a strange virile personality behind it, and that seemed to inspire us with his own confidence as by a process of radiation. Mr. Hubbard, he went on gravely, turning to the soldier, knows something of my methods, and in more than one uh, interesting situation, has proved of assistance. Well, we want now and here he suddenly got up and took his place on the mat beside the colonel and looked hard at him is men who have self-control who are sure of themselves whose mind at the critical moment 
will emit positive forces instead of the quavering and uncertain currents due to negative feelings, due, for instance, to fear. He looked at us each in turn. Colonel Ragg moved his feet further apart and squared his shoulders, and I felt guilty but said nothing, conscious that my latent store of courage was being deliberately hauled to the front. He was winding me up like a clock. So that, in what is yet to come, continued our leader, each of us will contribute his share of power and ensure success for my plan. I'm not afraid of anything I can see, said the colonel bluntly. I'm ready, I heard myself say, as it were automatically, for anything, and then added feeling the declaration was lamely insufficient, and everything. Dr. Silence left the mat and began walking to and fro about the room. Both hands plunged deep into the pockets of his shooting jacket. Tremendous vitality streamed from him. I never took my eyes off the small, moving figure. Small, yes, and yet somehow making me think of a giant plotting the destruction of worlds. And his manner was gentle as always, smoothing almost as words uttered quietly without emphasis or emotion. Most of what he said was addressed, though not too obviously to the colonel. The violence of this sudden attack, he said softly, pacing to and fro beneath the bookcase at the end of the room, is due, of course, partly to the fact that tonight the moon is at the full. Here he glanced at me for a moment, and partly to the fact that you have all been so deliberately concentrating upon the matter. Our thinking, our investigation, has stirred it into unusual activity. I mean that the intelligent force behind these manifestations has realized that someone is busy about its destruction, and it is now on the defensive. More, it is aggressive. But it, what is it, began the soldier fuming, what in the name of all that's dreadful is a fire elemental? I cannot give you at this moment, replied Dr. Silence, turning to him, but undisturbed by the interruption, a lecture on the nature and history of magic. I can only say that an elemental is the active force behind the elements, whether earth, air, water, or fire. It is impersonal in its essential nature, but can be focused, personified, and sold, so to say, by those who know how, by magicians, if you will, for certain purposes of their own, much in the same way that steam and electricity can be harnessed by the practical man of the century. Alone these blind elemental energies can accomplish little, but governed and directed by the trained will of a very powerful manipulator, they may become potent activities for good or evil. They are the basis of all magic, and it is the motive behind them that constitutes the magic, black or white. They can be vehicles of curses or of blessings, for a curse is nothing more than the thought of a violent will perpetuated in such cases, cases like this, the conscious directing will of the mind that is using the elemental stands always behind the phenomena. You think that my brother, broke in the colonel aghast, has nothing whatever to do with it, directly. The fire elemental that has been here tormenting you and your household was sent upon its mission long before you or your family or your ancestors or even the nation you belong to unless I am much mistaken, was even in existence. We will come to that a little later, after the experiment I propose to make, we shall be more positive. At present, I can only say we have to deal now, not only with the phenomena of attacking fire merely, but with the vindictive and enraged intelligence that is directing it from behind the scenes. Vindictive and enraged, he repeated the words. That explains, began Colonel Ragg, seeking furiously for words he could not fine quickly enough. Much, said John Silence, with a gesture to restrain him. He stopped a moment in the middle of his walk, and a deep silence came down over the little room. Through the windows the sunlight seemed less bright, the long line of dark hills less friendly, making me think of a vast wave towering to heaven and about to break and overwhelm us. Something formidable had crept into the world about us, for undoubtedly there was a disquieting thought, holding terror as well as awe. In the picture's words conjured up, the conception of a human will reaching his deathless hand, spiteful and destructive, down through the ages to strike the living and afflict the innocent. But what is its object? burst out the soldier, unable to restrain himself longer in the silence. Why does it come from that plantation? And why should it attack us or anyone in particular? Questions began to pour from him in a stream. 
all in good time, the doctor answered quietly, having let him run on for several minutes. But I must first discover positively what or who it is that directs this particular fire elemental. And to do that, we must first, he spoke with slow deliberation, seek to capture, to confirm by visibility, to limit its fear in a concrete form. Good heavens almighty, exclaimed the soldier, mixing his words in his unfeigned surprise. Quite so, pursued the other calmly, for in so doing, I think we can release it from the purpose that binds it, restore it to its normal conditions of latent fire, and also, he lowered his voice perceptibly, also discover the face and form of the being that ensouls it. The man behind the gun, cried the colonel, beginning to understand something and leaning forward so as not to miss a single syllable. I mean that in the last resort, before it returns to the womb of potential fire, it will probably assume the face and figure of its director, of the man of magical knowledge who originally bound it with his incantations and sent it forth upon its mission of, of centuries. The soldier sat down and gasped openly in his face, breathing hard, but it was a very subdued voice that framed the question. And how do you propose to make it visible? How capture and confine it? What do you mean, Dr. John's silence? By furnishing it with the materials for a form, by the process of materialization simply. Once limited by dimensions, it will become slow, heavy, visible. We can then dissipate it. Invisible fire, you see, is dangerous and incalculable. Locked up in a form, we can perhaps manage it. We must betray it to its death. And this material, we ask in the same breath, although I think I had already guessed. Not pleasant, but effective, came the quiet reply, the exhalations of freshly spilled blood. Not human blood, cried Colonel Ragg, starting up from his chair with a voice like an explosion. I thought his eyes would start from his sockets. The face of Dr. Silence relaxed in spite of himself, and a spontaneous little laugh brought a welcome, though momentary, relief. The days of human sacrifice, I hope, will never come again, he explained. Animal blood will answer the purpose, and we can make the experiment as pleasant as possible. Only the blood must be freshly spilled and strong with the vital emanations that attract this peculiar class of elemental creature. Perhaps, perhaps if some pig on the estate is ready for the market? He turned to hide a smile, but the passing touch of comedy found no echo in the mind of our host, who did not understand how to change quickly from one emotion to another. Clearly he was debating many things laboriously in his honest brain, but in the end the earnestness and scientific disinterestedness of the doctor whose influence over him was already very great, won the day, and he presently looked up more calmly and observed shortly that he thought perhaps the matter could be arranged. There are other and pleasanter methods, Dr. Silence went on to explain, but they require time and preparation, and things have gone much too far, in my opinion, to admit of delay, and the process need cause you no distress. We sit round the bowl and await results. Nothing more. The emanations of blood, which, as Levi says, is the first incarnation of the universal fluid, furnish the materials out of which the creature of discarnate life, spirits, if you prefer, can fashion themselves a temporary appearance. The process is old and lies at the root of all blood sacrifice. It was known to the priest of Baal, and it is known to the modern ecstasy dancers, who cut themselves to produce objective phantoms who dance with them, and the least gifted clairvoyant could tell you that the forms to be seen in the vicinity of slaughterhouses or hovering above the deserted battlefields are well simply beyond all description i do not mean he added noticing the uneasy fidgeting of his host that anything in our laundry experiment need appear to terrify us for this case seems a comparatively simple one and it is only the vindictive character of the intelligence directing this fire elemental that causes anxiety and makes for personal danger. It is curious, said the colonel, with a sudden rush of words, drawing a deep breath and as though speaking of things distasteful to him, that during my years among the hill tribes of northern India, I came across, personally came across, instances of the sacrifices of blood to certain deities being stopped suddenly and all manner of disasters happening until they were resumed. 
Fires broke out in the huts and even on the clothes of the natives. And, and I admit I have read, in the course of my studies, he made a gesture towards his books and heavily laden table, of the Yazidis of Syria evoking phantoms by means of cutting their bodies with knives during their whirling dances, enormous globes of fire which turned into monstrous and terrible forms. And I remember an account somewhere, too, how the emaciated forms and pallid countenance of the specters that appeared to the Emperor Julian claimed to be the true immortals and told him to renew the sacrifices of blood for the fumes of which, since the establishment of Christianity, they had been pining, that these were in reality the phantoms evoked by the rites of blood. Both Dr. Silence and myself listened in amazement, for this sudden speech was so unexpected and betrayed so much more knowledge than we had either was suspected in the old soldier. Then perhaps you have read too, said the doctor, that the cosmic deities of savage races, elemental in their nature, have been kept alive through many ages by these blood rites? No, he answered. That is new to me. In any case, Dr. Silence added, I am glad you are not wholly unfamiliar with the subject, for you will now bring more sympathy and therefore more help to our experiment. For of course, in this case, we only want the blood to tempt the creature from its lair and enclose it in a form. I quite understand. And I only hesitated just now, he went on, his words coming much more slowly, as though he felt he had already said too much, because I wish to be quite sure it was no mere curiosity, but an actual sense of necessity that dictated this horrible experiment. It is your safety and that of your household and of your sister that is at stake, replied the doctor. Once I have seen, I hope to discover whence this elemental comes and what its real purpose is. Colonel Rag signified his assent with a bow. And the moon will help us, the other said, for it will be full in the early hours of the morning, and this kind of elemental being is almost always active at the period of full moon. Hence you see the clue furnished by your diary. So it was finally settled. Colonel Rag would provide the materials for the experiment, and we were to meet at midnight. How he would contrive at that hour, but that was his business. I only know we both realized that he would keep his word, and whether Pig died at midnight or at noon was, after all, perhaps only a question of the sleep and personal comfort of the executioner. Tonight, then, in the laundry, said Dr. Silence, finally to clinch the plan, we three alone end at midnight, when the household is asleep, and we shall be free from disturbance. He exchanged significant glances with our host, who at that moment was called away by the announcement that the family doctor had arrived and was ready to see him in his sister's room. For the remainder of the afternoon, John Silas disappeared. I had my suspicions that he made a secret visit to the plantation and also to the laundry building. But in any case, we saw nothing of him and he kept strictly to himself. He was preparing for the night, I felt sure, but the nature of his preparation, I could only guess. There was movement in his room, I heard, and an odor like incense hung about the door, and knowing that he regarded rites as the vehicles of energies, my guesses were probably not far wrong. Colonel Rag too remained absent the greater part of the afternoon, and deeply afflicted, has scarcely left his sister's bedside. But in response to my inquiry, when we met for a moment at tea time, he told me that although she had moments of attempted speech, her talk was quite incoherent and hysterical, and she was still quite unable to explain the nature of what she had seen. The doctor, he said, feared she had recovered the use of her limbs only to lose that of her memory, perhaps even of her mind. Then the recovery of her legs, I trust, may be permanent at any rate, I ventured, finding it difficult to know what sympathy to offer, and he replied with a curious short laugh, Oh, yes, about that there can be no doubt whatever. And it was due merely to the chance of my overhearing a fragment of conversation, unwillingly, of course, that a little further light was thrown upon the state in which the old lady actually lay. For as I came out of my room, it happened that Colonel Rag and the doctor were going downstairs together, and their words flowed up to my ears before I could make my presence known by so much as a cough. Then you must find a way, the doctor was saying with decision, for I cannot insist too strongly upon that, and at all costs she must be kept quiet. These attempts to go out must be prevented, if necessary, by force. 
this desire to visit some wood or other she keeps talking about is of course hysterical in nature it cannot be permitted for a moment it shall not be permitted i heard the soldier reply as they reached the hall below it has impressed her mind for some reason the doctor went on by way evidently of soothing explanation and then the distance made it impossible for me to hear more at dinner dr sans was still absent on the public plea of a headache and though food was sent to his room i am inclined to believe he did not touch it but spent the entire time fasting we retired early desiring that the household should be due likewise and i must confess that at ten o'clock when i bid my host a temporary good night and sought my room to make what mental preparation i could i realized in no very pleasant fashion that it was a singular and formidable assignation this midnight meeting in the laundry building and that there were moments in every adventure of life when a wise man and one who knew his own limitations owed it to his dignity to withdraw discreetly and but for the character of our leader i probably should have then and there offered the best excuse i could think of and have allowed myself quietly to fall asleep and wait for an exciting story in the morning of what had happened but with a man before my fire counting the minutes and doing everything i could think of to fortify my resolution and fasten my will at the point where i could be reasonably sure that my self-control would hold against all attacks of men devils or elementals part three at a quarter before midnight clad in a heavy ulster and with slippered feet i crept cautiously from my room and stole down the passage to the top of the stairs outside the doctor's door i waited a moment to listen all was still the house in utter darkness no gleam of light beneath any door only down the length of the corridor from the direction of the sick room came faint sounds of laughter and incoherent talk that were not things to reassure a mind already half a tremble and i made haste to reach the hall and let myself out through the front door into the night the air was keen and frosty perfumed with night smells and exquisitely fresh all the million candles of the skies were alight and a faint breeze rose and fell with faraway sighings in the tops of the pine trees my blood leaped for a moment in the spaciousness of the night for the splendid stars brought courage but the next instant as i turned a corner of the house moving stealthily down the gravel drive my spirits sank again ominously for yonder over the funeral plumes of the twelve acre plantation i saw the huge and yellow face of the full moon just rising in the east staring down like some vast being come to watch upon the progress of our doom seen through the distorting vapors of the earth's atmosphere her face looked weirdly unfamiliar her usual expression of benign vacancy somehow a twist i slipped along by the shadows of the wall keeping my eyes upon the ground the laundry house as already ascribed stood detached from the other offices with laurel shrubberies crowding thickly behind it and the kitchen garden so close on the other side that the strong smells of soil and growing things came across almost heavily the shadows of the haunted plantation hugely lengthened by the rising moon behind them reached to the very walls and covered the stone tiles of the roof with a dark pall so keenly were my senses alert at this moment that i believe i could fill a chapter with the endless small details of the impression i received shadows odor shapes sounds in the space of the few seconds i stood and waited before the closed wooden door then i became aware of someone moving towards me through the moonlight and the figure of john silence without overcoat and bareheaded came quickly and without noise to join me his eyes i saw at once were wonderfully bright and so marked was the shining pallor of his face that i could hardly tell when he passed from the moonlight into the shade he passed without a word beckoning me to follow and then pushed the door open and went in the chill air of the place met us like that of an underground vault in the brick floor and whitewashed walls streaked with damp and smoke threw back the cold in our faces directly opposite gaped the black throat of the huge open fireplace the ashes of wood fires still piled and scattered about the hearth and on either side of the projecting chimney column were the deep recesses holding the big twin cauldrons for boiling clothes upon the lids of these cauldrons stood the two little oil lamps shaded red which gave all the light there was and immediately in front of the fireplace there was a small circular table with three chairs set about it overhead the narrow slit windows high up the walls pointed to a dim network of wooden rafters half lost among the shadows 
and then came the dark vault of the roof. Cheerless and unalluring for all the red light, it certainly was reminding me of some unused conventicle, bare of pews or pulpit, ugly and severe, and I was forcibly struck by the contrast between the normal uses to which the place was ordinarily put and the strange and medieval purpose which had brought us under its roof tonight. Possibly an involuntary shudder ran over me for my companion turned with a confident look to reassure me that he was so completely master of himself that I at once absorbed from his abundance and felt the chinks of my failing courage beginning to close up. To meet his eye in the presence of danger was like finding a mental railing that guided and supported thought along the giddy edges of alarm. I'm quite ready, I whispered, turning to listen for approaching footsteps. He nodded. Still keeping his eyes on mine, our whispered sounded hollow as it echoed overhead among the rafters. I'm glad you are here, he said. Not all would have the courage. Keep your thoughts controlled and imagine the protective shell around you, round your inner being. I'm all right, I repeated, cursing my chattering teeth. He took my hand and shook it, and the contact seemed to shake into me something of a supreme confidence. The eyes and hands of a strong man can touch the soul. I think he guessed my thought, for a passing smile flashed about the corners of his mouth. You'll feel more comfortable, he said in a low tone, when the chain is complete. The colonel we can count on, of course. Remember, though, he added warningly, he may perhaps become controlled, possessed, and the thing comes, because he won't know how to resist. And to explain the business of such a man, he shrugged his shoulders expressively, but it will only be temporary, and I will see that no harm comes to him. He glanced around at the arrangement with approval. Red light, he said, indicating the shaded lamps, has the lowest rate of vibration. Materializations are dissipated by strong light, won't form or hold together in rapid vibrations. I was not sure that I approved altogether of this dim light, for in complete darkness there is something protective, the knowledge that one cannot be seen, probably, which half a light destroys, but I remembered the warning to keep my thoughts steady, forbore to give them expression. There was a step outside and the figure of Colonel Rag stood in the doorway. Though entering on tiptoe, he made a considerable noise and clatter, for his free movements were impeded by the burden he carried, and we saw a large yellowish bowl held out at arm's length from his body, the mouth covered with a white cloth. His face, I noted, was rigidly composed. He, too, was master of himself. As I thought of this old soldier moving through the long series of alarms, worn with watching and wearied with assault, unenlightened yet undismayed, even down to the dreadful shock of his sister's terror and still showing the dogged pluck that persists in the face of defeat, I understood what Dr. Silence meant when he described him as a man to be counted on. I think there was nothing beyond this rigidity of his stern features and a certain grayness of the complexion to betray the turmoil of the emotions that was doubtless going on within, and the quality of these two men, each in his own way, so keyed me up that by time the door was shut and we had exchanged silent greetings, all the latent courage I possessed was well to the fore, and I felt as sure of myself as I knew I ever could feel. Colonel Ragg set the bowl carefully at the center of the table. Midnight, he said shortly, glancing at his watch, and we all three moved our, to our chairs. There in the middle of that cold and silent place we sat, with a vile bowl before us and a thin, hardly perceptible steam rising through the damp air from the surface of the white cloth and disappearing upwards the moment it passed beyond the zone of red light and into the deep shadows thrown forward by the projecting wall of the chimney. The doctor had indicated our respective places and I found myself seated with my back to the door and opposite the black hearth. The colonel was on my left and Dr. Silence on my right, both have facing me, the latter more shadow than the former. We thus divided the little table into even sections, sitting more in our chairs we awaited events in silence. For something like an hour, I do not think there was even the faintest sound within those four walls and under the canopy of that vaulted roof. Our slippers made no scratching on the gritty dirt, and our breathing was suppressed almost to nothing, even the rustle of our clothes as we shifted from time to time upon our seats was inaudible. Silence smothered us absolutely. The silence of night, of listening, the silence of a haunted expectancy. The very gurgling of the lamp was too soft to be heard, and if light itself had sound, I do not think we should have noticed the silvery thread of the moonlight 
as it entered the high narrow windows and threw upon the floor the slender traces of its pallid footsteps. Colonel Ragg and the doctor, and myself too for that matter, sat thus like figures of stone, without speech and without gesture. My eyes passed a ceaseless journey from the bowl to their faces and from their faces to the bowl. They might have been masks, however, for all the signs of life they gave and the light steaming from the horrid contents beneath the white cloth had long ceased to be visible. Then presently as the moon rose higher, the wind rose with it. It sighed like the lightest of passing wings. Over the roof, it crept most softly round the walls. It made the brick floor like ice beneath our feet. With it, I saw mentally the desolate moorland flowing like a sea about the old house, the treeless expanse of lonely hills, the nearer copses somber and mysterious in the night, the plantation too in particular I saw, and imagined I heard the mournful whisperings that must now be a stirring among its treetops as the breeze played down between the twisted stems. In the depth of the room behind us, the shafts of moonlight met and crossed in a growing network. It was after an hour of this wearing and unbroken attention, and I should judge about one o'clock in the morning, when the baying of the dogs in the stable yard first began, and I saw John Silence move suddenly in his chair and sit up in an attitude of attention. Every force in my being instantly leaped into the keenest vigilance. Colonel Ragg moved too, though slowly, and without raising his eyes from the table before him. The doctor stretched his arm out and took the white cloth from the bowl. It was perhaps imagination that persuaded me the red glare of the lamps grew fainter and the air over the table before us thickened. I had been expecting something for so long that the movement of my companions and the lifting of the cloth may easily have caused the momentary delusion that something hovered in the air before my face, touching the skin of my cheeks with a silken run. But it was certainly not a delusion, but the colonel looked up at the same moment and glanced over his shoulder as though his eyes followed the movement of something to and fro about the room, and that he then buttoned his overcoat more tightly about him, and his eyes sought my own face first, and then the doctor's. And it was no delusion that his face seemed somehow to have turned dark, become spread, as it were, with a shadowy blackness. I saw his lips tighten and his expression grow hard and stern, and it came to me with a rush that, of course, this man had told us but a part of the experience he had been through in the house and that there was much more he had never been able to bring himself to reveal at all. I felt sure of it. The way he turned and stared about him betrayed a familiarity with other things than those he had described to us. It was not merely a sight of fire he looked for. It was a sight of something alive, intelligent, something able to evade his searching. It was a person. It was the watch for the ancient being who sought to obsess him. And the way in which Dr. Silence answered his look that was only by a glance of subtle sympathy confirmed my impression. You may be ready now, I heard him say in a whisper, and I understood that his words were intended as a steadying warning, embraced myself mentally to the utmost of my power. Yet long before Colonel Ragg had turned to stare down about the room, and long before the doctor had confirmed my impression that things were at last beginning to stir, I had become aware, most singular fashion at the place, held more than our three selves. With the rising of the wind, this increase to our numbers had first taken place. The baying of the hounds almost seemed to have signaled it. I cannot say how it may be possible to realize that an empty place has suddenly become not empty, when the new arrival is nothing that appeals to any one of the senses. For this recognition of an invisible as one of the change in the balance of personal forces in a human group is indefinable and beyond proof yet it is unmistakable, and I knew perfectly well at what a given moment the atmosphere within these four walls became charged with the presence of other living beings besides ourselves, and on reflection I am convinced that both my companions knew it too. Watch the light, said the doctor under his breath, and then I knew too that it was no fancy of my own that had turned the air darker, and the way he turned to examine the face of our host sent an electric thrill of wonder and expectancy shivering along every nerve in my body. Yet it was no kind of terror that I experienced, but rather a sort of mental dizziness and a sensation as of being suspended in some remote and dreadful altitude where things might happen, indeed were about to happen, that ne'er before happened within the ken of man. Horror 
may have formed an ingredient, but it was not chiefly horror and in no sense ghostly horror. Uncommon thoughts kept beating on my brain like tiny hammers, soft yet persistent, seeking admission, their unbidden tide began to wash along the far fringes of my mind, the currents of unwanted sensations to rise over the remote frontiers of my consciousness. I was aware of thoughts and the fantasy seas of thought that I never knew before existed. Portions of my being stirred that had never stirred before and things ancient and inexplicable rose to the surface and beckoned me to follow. I felt as though I were about to fly off at some immense tangent into an outer space hitherto unknown, even in dreams. And so singular was the result produced upon me that I was uncommonly glad to anchor my mind as well as my eyes upon the masterful personality of the doctor at my side, for there I realized I could draw always upon the forces of sanity and safety. With a vigorous effort of will, I returned to the scene before me and tried to focus my attention with steadier thoughts upon the table and upon the silent figures seated around it, and then I saw that certain changes had come about in the place where we sat. The patches of moonlight on the floor, I noted, had become curiously shaded. The faces of my companions opposite were not so clearly visible as before, and the forehead and cheeks of Colonel Rag were glistening with perspiration. I realized further that an extraordinary change had come about in the temperature of the atmosphere. The increased warmth had a painful effect, not alone on Colonel Rag, but upon all of us. It was oppressive and unnatural. We gasped figuratively as well as actually. You're the first to feel it, said Dr. Silence in low tones, looking across at him. You are in more intimate touch, of course. The colonel was trembling and appeared to be in considerable distress. His knees shook so that the shuffling of his slippered feet became audible. He inclined his head to show that he had heard, but made no other reply. I think even then he was sore put to keep himself in hand. I knew what he was struggling against, as Dr. Silence had warned me. He was about to be obsessed, and was savagely, though vainly, resisting. But meanwhile, a curious and whirling sense of exhilaration began to come over me. The increasing heat was delightful, bringing a sensation of intense activity, of thoughts pouring through the mind at high speed, of vivid pictures in the brain, of fierce desires and lightning energies alive in every part of the body. I was conscious of no physical distress, such as the colonel felt, but only of a vague feeling that it might all grow suddenly too intense, that it might be consumed, that my personality as well as my body might become resolved into the flame of pure spirit. I began to live at a speed too intense to last. It was as if a thousand ecstasies besieged me. Steady, whispered the voice of John Silence in my ear, and I looked up with a start to see that the colonel had risen from his chair. The doctor rose too. I followed suit and for the first time saw down into the bowl. To my amazement and horror, I saw that the contents were troubled. The blood was astir with movement. The rest of the experiment was witnessed by us standing. I came to the curious suddenness. There was no more dreaming for me at any rate. I shall never forget the figure of Colonel Rag standing there beside me, upright and unshaken, squarely planted on his feet, looking about him, puzzled, beyond belief, yet full of a fighting anger, framed by the white walls, the red glow of the lamps upon his streaming cheeks, his eyes glowing against the deathly pallor of his skin, breathing hard and making convulsive efforts of hands and body to keep himself under control, his whole being roused to the point of savage fighting, yet without nothing visible to get at anywhere. He stood there, immovable against odds, and the strange contrast of the pale skin and the burning face I had never seen before or wished to see again. But what has left an even sharper impression on my memory was the blackness that then began crawling over his face, obliterating the features, concealing their human outline, and hiding him inch by inch from view. This was my first realization that the process of materialization was at work. His visage became enshrouded. I moved from one side to the other to keep him in view, and it was only when I understood that, properly speaking, the blackness was not upon the countenance of Colonel Rag, but that something had inserted itself between me and him, thus screening his face with the effect of a dark veil. Something that apparently rose through the floor was passing slowly into the air above the table and above the bowl. The blood in the bowl, moreover, was considerably less than before. And with this change in the air before us, 
There came at the same time a further change, I thought, in the face of the soldier. One half was turned towards the red lamps, while the other caught the pale illumination of the moonlight, falling aslant from the high windows, so that it was difficult to estimate this change with accuracy of detail. But it seemed to me that while the features, eyes, nose, mouth remained the same, the life informing them had undergone some profound transformation. The signature of a new power had crept into the face and left its traces there, an expression dark and in some unexplainable way terrible. Then suddenly he opened his mouth and spoke, and the sound of this changed voice, deep and musical though it was, made me cold and set my heart beating with uncomfortable rapidity. The being, as he had dreaded, was always in control of his brain, using his mouth. I see a blackness like the blackness of Egypt before my face, said the tones of this unknown voice that seemed half his own and half another. And out of this darkness they come, they come. I gave him a dreadful start. The doctor turned to look at me for an instant and then turned to center his attention upon the figure of our host. And I understood in some intuitive fashion that he was there to watch over the strangest contest man ever saw. To watch over and, if necessary, to protect. He is being controlled, possessed, he whispered to me through the shadows. His face wore a wondrous expression, half triumph, half admiration. Even as Colonel Wright spoke, it seemed to me that this visible darkness began to increase, pouring up thickly out of the ground by the hearth, rising up in sheets and veils, shrouding our eyes and faces. It stole up from below an awful blackness that seemed to drink in all the radiations of light in the building, leaving nothing but the ghost of a radiance in their place. Then, out of this rising sea of shadows, issued a pale and spectral light that gradually spread itself about us, and from the heart of this light I saw the shapes of fire crowd and gather. And these were not human shapes, or the shapes of anything I recognized as alive in the world, but outlines of fire that trace globes, triangles, crosses, and the luminous bodies of various geometrical figures. They grew bright, faded, and then grew again, with an effect almost of pulsation. They passed swiftly to and fro through the air, rising and falling, and particularly in the immediate neighborhood of the colonel, often gathering about his head and shoulders, an earring appearing to settle upon him like a giant insect of flame. They were accompanied, moreover, by a faint sound of hissing, the same sound we had heard that afternoon in the plantation. The fire elemental that precede their master, the doctor said in an undertone, be ready. And while this weird display of the shapes of fire alternately flashed and faded, and the hissing echoed faintly among the dim rafters overhead, we heard the awful voice issue at intervals from the lips of the afflicted soldier. It was a voice of power, splendid in some way I cannot describe, and with a certain sense of majesty in its cadences. And as I listened to it with quickly beating heart, I could fancy it was some ancient voice of time itself, echoing down immense corridors of stone, from the depths of vast temples, from the very heart of mountain tombs. I have seen my divine father, Osiris, thundered the great tones. I have scattered the gloom of the night. I have burst through the earth and am one with the starry deities. Something grand came into the soldier's face. He was staring fixedly before him as though seeing nothing. Watch, whispered Dr. Silence in my ear, and his whisper seemed to come from very far away. Again the mouth opened, and the awesome voice issued forth. Toth, it boomed, has loosened the bandages of Set, which fettered my mouth. I have taken my place in the great winds of heaven. I heard the little wind of night, with its mournful voice of ages, sighing round the walls and over the roof. Listen, came from the doctor at my side, and the thunder of the voice continued. I have hidden myself with you, O ye stars, that never diminish. I remember my name in the house of fire. The voice ceased, and the sound died away. Something about the face and figure of Colonel Rag relaxed, I thought. The terrible look passed from his face. The being that obsessed him was gone. The great ritual, said Dr. Silence, aside to me very low. The Book of the Dead. Now it's leaving him. Soon the blood will fashion to a body. Colonel Rag, who had stood absolutely motionless all this time, suddenly swayed so I thought he was going to fall, and but for the quick support of the doctor's arm, he probably would have fallen, for he staggered as in the beginning of collapse. I'm drunk with the wine of Osiris, he cried, and it was half with his own voice this time, 
but Horus the Eternal Watcher is about my path for safety. The voice dwindled and failed, dying away into something almost like a cry of distress. Now watch closely, said Dr. Silence, speaking loud, for after the cry will come the fire. I began to tremble involuntarily. An awful change had come without warning into the air. My legs grew weak as paper beneath my weight, and I had to support myself by leaning on the table. Colonel Rag, I saw, was also leaning forward with a kind of droop. The shapes of fire had vanished all, but his face was lit by the red lamps and the pale shifting moonlight rose behind him like mist. We were both gazing at the bowl, now almost empty. The colonel stooped so low, I feared every minute he would lose his balance and drop into it, and the shadow that had so long been in process of forming now at length began to assume material outline in the air before us. Then John Silence moved forward quickly. He took his place between us and the shadow. Erect, formidable, absolute master of the situation, I saw him stand there, his face calm and almost smiling, and fire in his eyes. His protective influence was astounding and incalculable. Even the abhorrent dread I felt at the sight of the creature growing into life and substance before us lessened in some way, so that I was able to keep my eyes fixed on the air above the bowl without too vivid a terror. But as it took shape, rising out of nothing, as it were, and growing momentarily, more defined in outline, a period of utter and wonderful silence settled down upon the building and all it contained, a hush of ages, like the sudden center of peace at the heart of the traveling cyclone, descended through the night, and out of this hush, as out of the emanations of the steaming blood, issued the form of the ancient being that first sent the elemental of fire upon its mission. It grew and darkened and solidified before our eyes. It rose from just beyond the table, so that the lower portions remained invisible, but I saw the outline limit itself upon the air, as though slowly revealed by the rising of a curtain. It apparently had not then quite concentrated to the normal proportions, but was spread out on all sides into space, huge though rapidly condensing, for I saw the colossal shoulders, the neck, the lower portions of the dark jaws, the terrible mouth, and then the teeth and lips, and as the veil seemed to lift further upon the tremendous face, I saw the nose and cheekbones. In another moment, I should have looked straight into the eyes. But what Dr. Sinus did at that very moment was so unexpected and took me so by surprise that I have never yet properly understood its nature and has never yet seen fit to explain in detail to me. He uttered some sound that had a note of command in it and in so doing stepped forward and intervened between me and the face. The figure just nearing completeness, he therefore hid from my sight and have always thought purposely hid from my sight. The fire, he cried out, the fire, beware. There was a sudden roar as of flames from the very mouth of the pit, and for the space of a single second, all grew light as day. A blinding flash passed across my face, and there was a heat for an instant that seemed to shrivel skin and flesh and bone. Then came steps, and I heard Colonel Rag utter a great cry, wilder than any human cry I have ever known. The heat sucked all the breath out of my lungs with a rush, and the blaze of light, as it vanished, swept my vision with its into enveloping darkness. When I recovered the use of my senses a few moments later, I saw that Colonel Rag, with a face of death, its whiteness strangely stained, had moved closer to me. Dr. Silence stood beside him, an expression of triumph and success in his eyes. The next minute the soldier tried to clutch me with his hand. Then he reeled, staggered, and unable to save himself, fell with a great crash upon the brick floor. After the sheet of flame, a wind raged round the building, as though it would lift the roof off, but then passed as suddenly as it came, and in the intense calm that followed, I saw that the form had vanished, and the doctor was stooping over Colonel Rag upon the floor, trying to lift him to a sitting position. Light, he said quietly, more light. Take the shades off. Colonel Rag sat up in the glare of the unshaded lamps, fell upon his face. It was gray and drawn, still running heat, and there was a look in his eyes and about the corner of his mouth that seemed in this short space of time to have added years to its age. At the same time, the expression of effort and anxiety had left it. It showed relief. Gone, he said, looking up at the doctor in a dazed fashion and struggling to his feet. Thank God, it's gone at last. He stared round the laundry as though to find out where he was. Did it control me? Take possession of me? Did I talk nonsense? He asked bluntly. After the heat came, I remember nothing. You'll feel yourself again in a few minutes, the doctor said. 
To my infinite horror, I saw that he was capriciously wiping sundry dark stains from the face. Our experiment has been a success, and he gave me a swift glance to hide the bowl, standing between me and our host while I hurriedly stuffed it down under the lid of the nearest cauldron. And none of us the worse for it, he finished. And fires, he asked still days. There'll be no more fires? It is dissipated, partly, at any rate, replied Dr. Silence cautiously. And the man behind the gun, he went on, only half realizing what he was saying. I think, have you, have you discovered that a form materialized? Said the doctor briefly. I know for certain now what the directing intelligence was behind it all. Colonel Wright pulled himself together and got upon his feet. The words conveyed no clear meaning to him yet, but his memory was returning gradually, and he was trying to piece together the fragments into a connected whole. He shivered a little, for the place had grown suddenly chilly. The air was empty again, lifeless. You feel all right again now, Dr. Silence said, in the tone of a man stating a fact rather than asking a question. Thanks to you both, yes. He drew a deep breath and mopped his face, and he would attempt a smile. He made me think of a man coming from the battlefield with a stain of fighting still upon him, but scornful of his wounds. Then he turned gravely towards the doctor, with a question in his eyes. Memory had returned, and he was himself again. Precisely what I expected, the doctor said calmly. A fire elemental, sent upon its mission in the days of Thebes, centuries before Christ. And tonight, for the first time all these thousands of years, released from the spell that originally bound it. We stared at him in amazement. Colonel Ragg, opening his lips for words that refused to shape themselves. And if we dig, he continued significantly, pointing to the floor where the blackness had poured up, we shall find some underground connection, a tunnel most likely leading to the 12-acre wood. It was made by your predecessor. A tunnel made by my brother? Gasped the soldier. Then my sister should know. She lived here with him. He stopped suddenly. John Silence inclined his head slowly. I think so, he said quietly. Your brother, no doubt, was as much tormented as you have been. He continued, after a pause in which Colonel Ragg seemed deeply preoccupied with his thoughts, and tried to find peace by burying it in the wood, in surrounding the wood then, like a large magic circle, with the enchantments of the old formula. So the stars the man saw blazing, but burying what? asked the soldier faintly, stepping backwards towards the support of the wall. Dr. Silence regarded us both intently for a moment before he replied. I think he weighed in his mind whether to tell us now or when the investigation was absolutely complete. The mummy, he said softly, after a moment, the mummy that your brother took from its resting place of centuries and brought home here. Colonel Wright dropped down upon the nearest chair, hanging breathlessly on every word. He was far too amazed for speech. The mummy of some important person, a priest most likely, protected from disturbance and desecration by the ceremonial magic of the time, for they understood how to attach to the mummy, to lock up with it in the tomb an elemental force that would direct itself even after ages upon anyone who dared to molest it. In this case, it was an elemental fire. Dr. Silence crossed the floor and turned out the lamps one by one. He had nothing more to say for the moment. Following his example, I folded this table together and took up the chairs, and our host, still dazed and silent, mechanically obeyed him and moved to the door. We removed all traces of the experiment, taking the empty bowl back to the house concealed beneath an ulster. The air was cool and fragrant as we walked to the house, the stars beginning to fade overhead and a fresh wind of early morning blowing up out of the east where the sky was already hinting of the coming day. It was after five o'clock. Stealthily, we entered the front hall and locked the door, and as we went on tiptoe upstairs to our rooms, the colonel peering at us over his candle as he nodded good night, whispered that if we were ready, the digging should be begun that very day. Then I saw him steal along to his sister's room and disappear. Part Four but not even the mysterious reference to the mummy or the prospect of a revelation by digging were able to hinder the reaction that followed the intense excitement of the past 12 hours. And I slept the sleep of the dead, dreamless and undisturbed, 
A touch on the shoulder woke me, and I saw Dr. Steinland standing beside the bed dressed to go out. Come, he said. It's tea time. You slept the best part of a dozen hours. I sprang up and made a hurried toilet, while my companion sat and talked. He looked fresh and rested, and his manner was even quieter than usual. Colonel Rugg has provided spades and pickaxes. We're going out to unearth this mummy at once, he said, and there's no reason we should not get away by the morning train. I'm ready to go tonight, if you are, I said honestly. But Dr. Science shook his head. I must see this through to the end, he said gravely, and in a tone that made me think he still anticipated serious things. Perhaps, he went on talking while I dressed. This case is really typical of all stories of mummy haunting, and none of them are cases to trifle with, he explained, for the mummies of important people, kings, priests, magicians, were laid away with profoundly significant ceremonial and were very effectively protected, as you have seen against desecration, and especially against destruction. The general belief, he went on anticipating my question, held, of course, that the perpetuity of the mummy guaranteed that of its ka, the owner spirit, but it is not improbable that the magical embalming was also used to retard reincarnation, the preservation of the body preventing the return of the spirit to the toil and discipline of earth life, and in any case they knew how to attach powerful guardian forces to keep off trespassers, anyone who dared to remove the mummy, or especially to unwind it, while well, he added, with meaning, you have seen, and you will see. I caught his face in the mirror while I struggled with my collar. It was deeply serious. There could be no question that he spoke of what he believed and knew. The traveler brother who brought it here must have been haunted too. He continued, for he tried to banish it by burial in the wood, making a magic circle to enclose it. Something of genuine ceremonial he must have known, for the stars the man saw were of course the remains of the still flaming pentagrams he traced at intervals in the circle. Only he did not know enough, or possibly was ignorant, that the mummy's guardian was a fire force. Fire cannot be enclosed by fire, though as you saw, it can be released by it. Then that awful figure in the laundry, I asked, thrilled to find him so communicative. Undoubtedly, the actual ka of the mummy, operating always behind its agent, the elemental, and most likely thousands of years old. And Miss Rag, I ventured once more. Ah, Miss Rag, he repeated it with increased gravity. Miss Rag. A knock at the door brought a servant with word that tea was ready and the colonel had sent to ask that we were coming down. The thread was broken. Dr. Silence moved to the door and signed for me to follow, but his manner told me that in any case no real answer would have been forthcoming to my question. And the place to dig in, I asked, unable to restrain my curiosity. Will you find it by some process of divination? He paused at the door and looked back at me, and with that he left me to finish my dressing. It was growing dark when the three of us silently made our way to the twelve-acre plantation. The sky was overcast and a black wind came out of the east. Gloom hung about the old house and the air seemed full of sighings. We found the tools already laid at the edge of the wood, and each shouldering his piece, we followed our leader at once in among the trees. He went straight forward for some twenty yards and then stopped. At his feet lay the blackened circle of one of the burned places. It was just discernible against the surrounding white grass. There are three of these, he said, and they all lie in a line with one another. Any one of them will tap the tunnel that connects the laundry, the former museum, with the chamber where the mummy now lies buried. He at once cleared away the burnt grass and began to dig. We all began to dig. While I used the pick, the others shoveled vigorously. No one spoke. Colonel Rag worked with the hardest of the three. The soil was light and sandy, and there was only a few snake-like roots and occasional loose stones to delay us. The pick made short work of these, and meanwhile the darkness settled about us, and the biting wind swept roaring through the trees overhead. Then quite suddenly, without a cry, Colonel Rag disappeared up to his neck. The tunnel, cried the doctor, helping to drag him out, red, breathless, and covered with sand and perspiration. Now, let me lead the way, and he slipped down nimbly into the hole, so that a moment later we heard his voice, muffled by sand and distance, rising up to us. Hubbard, you come next, and then Colonel Rag, if he wishes, we heard. I'll follow you, of course, he said, looking at me as I scrambled in. The hole was bigger now, and I got down on all fours, in a channel not much bigger than the large sewer pipe, 
and find myself in total darkness. A minute later, a heavy thud, followed by a cataract of loose sand, announced the arrival of the colonel. Catch hold of my heel, called Dr. Silence, and Colonel Wright can take yours. In this slow, laborious fashion, we wormed our way along a tunnel that had been roughly dug out of the shifting sand, was shored up clumsily by means of wooden pillars and posts. Any moment it seemed to me we might be buried alive. We could not see an inch before our eyes, but had to grope our way feeling the pillars and the walls. It was difficult to breathe, and the colonel behind me made but slow progress, for the cramped position of our bodies was very severe. We had traveled in this way for ten minutes and gone perhaps as much as ten yards when I lost my grasp of the doctor's heel. I heard his voice sounding above me somewhere. He was standing up in a clear space, and the next moment I was standing beside him. Colonel Ragg came heavily after, and he too rose up and stood. Then Dr. Silence produced his candle, and we heard preparations for striking matches. Yet even before there was light, an indefinable sensation of awe came over us. In this hole in the sand, some three feet underground, we stood side by side, cramped and huddled, struck suddenly with an overwhelming apprehension of something ancient, something formidable, something incalculably wonderful that touched in each one of us a sense of the sublime and the terrible even before we could see an inch before our faces. I know not how to express in language the singular emotion that caught us here in utter darkness, touching no sense directly, it seemed, yet with a recognition that before us, in the blackness of this underground night, there lay something that was mighty with the mightiness of long past ages. I felt Colonel Ragg pressing closely to my side, and I understood the pressure and welcomed it. No human touch to me at least has ever been more eloquent. Then the match fired, a thousand shadows fled on black wings, and I saw John Silence fumbling with a candle, his face lit up grotesquely by the flickering light below it. I had dreaded this light, yet when it came there was apparently nothing to explain the profound sensation of dread that preceded it. We stood in a small vaulted chamber in the sand, the sides and roof, shored with bars of wood, and the ground laid roughly with what seemed to be tiles. It was six feet high so that we could all stand comfortably, and may have been ten feet long by eight feet wide. Upon the wooden pillars at the side I saw that Egyptian hieroglyphics had been rudely traced by burning. Dr. Silence lit three candles and handed one to each of us. He placed a fourth in the sand against the wall on his right, and another to mark the entrance to the tunnel. We stood and stared about us, instinctively holding our breath. Empty by God, exclaimed Colonel Wright. His voice trembled with excitement. And then, as his eyes rested on the ground, he added, And footsteps, look, footsteps in the sand. Dr. Silence said nothing. He stooped down and began to make a search of the chamber. And as he moved, my eyes followed his crouching figure and noted the queer distorted shadows that poured over the walls and ceiling after him. Here and there, thin trickles of loose sand ran fizzling down the sides. The atmosphere heavily charged with faint yet pungent odors. They utterly still, and the flames of the candles might have been painted on the air for all the movement they betrayed. And as I watched, it was almost necessary to persuade myself forcibly that I was only standing upright with difficulty in this little sand hole of a modern garden in the south of England. For it seemed to me that I stood as in vision at the entrance of some vast rock-hewn temple, far, far down the river of time. The illusion was powerful and persisted. Granite columns that rose to heaven piled themselves about me, majestically uprearing, and a roof like the sky itself spread above a line of colossal figures that moved in shadowy procession along endless and stupendous aisles. This huge and splendid fantasy, born I knew not whence, possessed me so vividly that I was actually obliged to concentrate my attention upon the small stooping figure of the doctor as he groped about the walls in order to keep the eye of imagination on the scene before me. But the limited space rendered a long search out of the question, and his footsteps, instead of shuffling through loose sand, presently struck something of a different quality that gave forth a hollow and resounding echo. He stooped to examine more closely. He was standing exactly in the center of the little chamber, when this happened, and he at once began scraping away the sand with his feet. In less than a minute, a smooth surface became visible, the surface of a wooden covering. The next thing I saw was that he had raised it and was peering down into a space below. 
instantly a strong odor of niter and bitumen, mingled with a strange perfume of unknown and powdered aromatics, rose up from the uncovered space and filled the vault, stinging the throat and making the eyes water and smart. The mummy, whispered Dr. Silence, looking up into our faces over his candle, and as he said the word I felt the soldier lurch against me and heard his breathing in my ear. The mummy? He repeated under his breath as we pressed forward to look. It is difficult to say exactly why the sight should have stirred in me so prodigious an emotion of wonder and veneration, for I have had not a little to do with mummies, have unwound scores of them and even experimented magically with not a few, but there was something in the sight of that gray and silent figure lying in its modern box of lead and wood at the bottom of this sandy grave, swathed in the bandages of centuries and wrapped in the perfumed linen that the priests of Egypt had prayed over with their mighty enchantments thousands of years before. Something in the sight of it, lying there and breathing its own spice-laden atmosphere, even in the darkness of its exile in this remote land, something that pierced to the very core of my being and touched that root of awe which slumbers in every man near the birth of tears and the passion of true worship. I remember turning quickly from the colonel, lest he should see my emotion, it failed to understand its cause, turned and clutched John Silence by the arm, and the fall trembling to see that he too had lowered his head and was hiding his face in his hands. A kind of whirling storm came over me, rising out of I know not what utter deeps of memory, and in a whiteness of vision I heard the magical old chantings from the Book of the Dead and saw the gods pass by in dim procession, the mighty immemorial beings who were yet themselves only the personified attributes of the true gods, the god with the eyes of fire, the god with the face of smoke, I saw again Anubis, the dog-faced deity, and the children of Horus, eternal watcher of the ages, as they swathed Osiris, the first mummy of the world, and the scented and mystic bands, and I tasted again something of the ecstasy of the justified soul as it embarked in the golden boat of Ra, and journeyed onward to rest in the fields of the blessed. And then, as Dr. Silence with infinite reverence stooped and touched the still face so dreadfully staring with its painted eyes there rose again to our nostrils wave upon wave of this perfume of thousands of years and time fled backwards like a thing of naught showing me in haunted panorama the most wonderful dream of the whole world a gentle hissing became audible in the air and the doctor moved quickly backwards came close to our faces and then seemed to play about the walls and ceiling the last of the fire still waiting for its full accomplishment he muttered but i heard both words hissing as things far away i was still busy with the journey of the soul through the seven halls of death listening for echoes of the grandest rituals ever known to men the earthen plates covered with hieroglyphics still lay beside the mummy and rally carefully arranged at the points of the compass stood the four jars with the head of the hawk the jackal the sin of phallus the man the jars in which were placed the hair, the nail parings, the heart, and other special portions of the body, even the amulets, the mirror, the blue clay statues of the Ka, and the lamp with the seven wicks were there. Only the sacred scarabus was missing. Not only had it been torn from its ancient resting place, I heard Dr. Silence saying in a solemn voice, as he looked at Colonel Rod with fixed gaze, but it had been partially unwound. He pointed to the wrappings of the breast and the scarabus had been removed from the throat. The hissing that was like the hissing of an invisible flame had ceased only from time to time. We heard it as though it passed backwards and forwards in the tunnel, and we stood looking into each other's face without speaking. Presently, Colonel Rag made a great effort and braced himself. I heard the sound catch in his throat before the words actually became audible. My sister, he said very low, and then there followed a long pause broken at length by John's silence. It must be replaced, he said significantly. I knew nothing, the soldier said, forcing himself to speak the words he hated, saying, absolutely nothing. It must be returned, repeated the other, if it is not now too late, for I fear, I fear, Colonel Rag made a movement of assent with his head. It shall be, he said. The place was still as the grave. I do not know what it was then that made us all three turn around, with so sudden a start, for there was no sound audible to my ears, at least. The doctor was on the point of replacing the lid over the mummy when he straightened up as if he had been shot. There's something coming, said Colonel Rag under his breath, and the doctor's eyes, peering down the hall, 
the small opening of the tunnel showed me the true direction. A distant shuffling noise became distinctly audible, coming from a point about halfway down the tunnel we had so laboriously penetrated. It's the sand falling in, I said, though I knew it was foolish. No, said the colonel calmly, in a voice that seemed to have the ring of iron. I have heard it for some time past. It is something alive and it is coming nearer. He stared about him with a look of resolution that made his face almost noble. The heart in his heart was overmastering, yet he stood there prepared for anything that might come. There is no other way out, John Silas said. He leaned the lady against the sand and waited. I knew by the mask-like expression of his face, the pallor and the steadiness of the eyes, that he anticipated something that might be very terrible, appalling. The colonel and myself stood on either side of the opening. I still held my candle and was ashamed of the way it shook, dripping the grease all over me, but the soldier had set his into the sand just behind his feet. Thoughts of being buried alive, of being smothered like rats in a trap, of being caught and done to death by some invisible and merciless force we could not grapple with rushed into my mind. Then I thought of fire, of suffocation, of being roasted alive. The perspiration began to pour from my face. Steady came the voice of Dr. Silence to me through the vault. For five minutes, that seemed fifty, we stood waiting, looking from each other's faces to the mummy, and from the mummy to the hole, and all the time the shuffling sound, soft and stealthy, came gradually nearer. The tension, for me at least, was very near the breaking point, when at last the cause of the disturbance reached the edge. It was hidden for a moment just behind the broken rib of soil. A jet of sand shaken by the close vibration trickled down on the ground. I've never in my life seen anything fall with such laborious leisure. The next second, uttering a cry of curious quality, it came into view. It was far more distressingly horrible than anything I had anticipated. From the sight of some Egyptian monster, some god of the tombs, or even of some demon of fire, I think I was already half prepared. But when instead I saw the white visage of Miss Rag, framed in that round opening of sand, followed by her body, crawling on all fours, her eyes bulging, reflecting the yellow glare of the candles. My first instinct was to turn and run like a frantic animal, seeking a way of escape. But Dr. Silence, who seemed no whit surprised, caught my arm and steadied me, and we both saw the colonel, then drop upon his knees and come thus to a level with his sister. For more than a whole minute, as though struck in stone, the two faces gazed silently at each other. Here's for all the dreadful emotion in it, more like a gargoyle than anything human and his white and blank, with an expression that was beyond either astonishment or alarm. She looked up, he looked down. It was a picture in a nightmare and a candle, stuck in the sand close to the hole, threw upon it the glare of impromptu footlights. Then John Silence moved forward and spoke in a voice that was very low, yet perfectly calm and natural. I'm glad you have come, he said. You are the one person whose presence at this moment is most required, and I hope that you may yet be in time to appease the anger of the fire and to bring peace again to your household. And he added, lower still so that no one heard it but myself. Safety to yourself. And while her brother stumbled backwards, crushing a candle into the sand in his awkwardness, the old woman crawled further into the vaulted chamber and slowly rose upon her feet. At the sight of the wrapped figure of the mummy, I was fully prepared to see her scream and faint, but on the contrary to my complete amazement, she merely bowed her head and dropped quietly upon her knees. And after a pause of more than a minute, she raised her eyes to the roof and her lips began to mutter as in prayer. Her right hand, meanwhile, which had been fumbling for some time at her throat, suddenly came away and before the gaze of all of us she held it out, palm upward over the great ancient figure outstretched below, and in it we beheld glistening the green jasper of the stolen scarabus. Her brother leaning heavily against the wall behind uttered a sound that was half cry, half exclamation, but John Silence, standing directly in front of her, merely fixed his eyes on her and pointed downward to the staring face below. Replace it, he said sternly, where it belongs. Miss Rag was kneeling at the feet of the mummy when this happened. We three men all had our eyes riveted on what followed. Only the reader, who by some remote chance may have witnessed a line of mummies freshly laid from their tombs upon the sand, slowly stir and bend as the heat of the Egyptian sun warms their ancient bodies into the semblance of life, can form any conception of the ultimate horror we experience 
when the silent figure before us moved in its grave of lead and sand. Slowly before our eyes it ripped, and with a faint rustling of the immemorial sediments, rose up and through sightless and bandaged eyes stared across the yellow candle light at the woman who had violated it. I tried to move. Her brother tried to move, but the sand seemed to hold our feet. I tried to cry. Her brother tried to cry. But the sand seemed to fill our lungs and throat. We could only stare, and even so, the sand seemed to rise like a desert storm and cloud our vision. And when I managed at length to open my eyes again, the mummy was lying once more upon its back, motionless, the shrunken and painted face upturned toward the ceiling. The old lady had tumbled forward and was lying in the semblance of death with her head and arms upon its crumbling body. But upon the wrappings of the throat, I saw the green jasper of the sacred scarabus shining again like a living eye. Colonel Rag and the doctor recovered themselves long before I did, and I found myself helping them clumsily and unintelligently to raise the frail body of the old lady, while John Silence carefully replaced the covering over the grave and scraped back the sand with his foot while he issued brief directions. I heard his voice as in a dream, but the journey back along that cramped tunnel, weighted by a dead woman, blinded with sand, suffocated with heat, was in no sense a dream. It took us the best part of half an hour to reach the open air, and even then we had to wait a considerable time for the appearance of Dr. Silence. We carried her undiscovered into the house and up to her room. The, the mummy will cause no further disturbance, I heard Dr. Silence say to our host later that evening as we prepared to drive for the night train. Provided always, he added significantly, that you and yours cause it no disturbance. It was in a dream, too, that we left. You did not see her face, I know, he said to me as we wrapped our rugs about us in the empty compartment. And when I shook my head, quite unable to explain the instinct that had come to me not to look, he turned towards us, his face pale and genuinely sad. Scorch and blasted, he whispered.